Are you at home? I, yeah, I'm at home. I got a oh. I, I got to check out. Before we okay. Go, I got to get my daughter outside. Okay. 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 All right. Evelyn. Okay, folks. Um, I believe we're live streaming. So uh, welcome back to the continuing public hearings of the Environment and Transportation Committee. I am, as always, your friendly chairman, Kumar Barve. Uh, <clears throat> I'm joined by the vice chair, Dana Stein, also very friendly. So we're gonna take these bills in numerical order and let me read them out. House Bill 325, Delegate uh, Motts. House Bill 738, the speaker on behalf of the Attorney General. House Bill 755, Delegate T. How do you pronounce time? How do you pronounce her name? T H I A M. I'm going to have to ask her when she uh, comes up. Uh, House Bill 799, Delegate Clark. House Bill 800, Delegate Clark. House Bill 807, Delegate Love. House Bill 831, Delegate Charcutian. House Bill 860, Delegate Gil Gilchrist. Let me say that the second bill we're going to be hearing is probably the of. Uh, well, it's definitely the most controversial of all the bills that we're hearing today. Uh, rather than having it at the very end in order to wear people down, I'm gonna have it second because it's a new issue area, it's complex, and I'd like to have a robust conversation, although let's not go overboard. So <laughs> what was that? Let's uh, Mr. Off. Chairman, Mr. Um, the Attorney General is, is not gonna be available for just a little while. So I told him you would just, when he comes, you take him. Okay, well, that, that then we'll go through some of the other bills. When he shows up, we'll get to that bill. Okay, so let's begin with House Bill 325, uh, Delegate Johnny Motts. Johnny, you have four minutes. The timer is two. So like on the Love Connection, uh, Chuck Woolery would say two and two. So you've got four <laughs> minutes. Go for it. Uh, thanks, Chairman and uh, distinguished colleagues. It's great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'll be much less than four minutes. Um, this bill was approved um, by the committee last year. I think it may be a little bit different in that um, this year, the version of the bill includes public lands and it would allow Sunday deer hunting um, uh, the first Sunday of October through the second Sunday of January. Um, and it also provides for Sunday hunting um, on, um, on a youth turkey day in the spring. Now there's a set of amendments in your packets, if you have packets or email, and those are from the Department of Natural Resources. Those amendments somewhat changed the bill. And um, I believe the way the amendments work is they would add uh, some additional uh, Sundays for, um, for turkey hunting. Um, you know, when I first got elected, uh, hunting is a part of the culture on the Eastern shore. Uh, maybe I was a little naive, maybe a little overexcited, but you know, I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to get involved in introducing legislation dealing with hunting season. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, you know, personally, my, my belief is this should be handled by the experts, the scientists at the Department of Natural Resources, but we've got the system that we have where certain counties require um, laws to be passed in order for them to change the seasons. And that's kind of what this bill, in my view, does. And it, you know, it would it would just basically take what the department feels is appropriate um, and make these seasons available um, in Talbot. Uh, one of the problems we have is you've got different rules for different counties. You've got people using the same areas, and and this is the attempt of doing this is basically to harmonize um, with all the counties. Uh, you know, there's uh, all the hunting uh, seasons are, are controversial, and I respect those controversies. You know, especially in a tight -knit community. Okay, you're now on. It's important to remember that we do have um, a lot of deer here. We do have a lot of deer permits. So we do have hunting year round, deer hunting in particular, and we have it on Saturdays and Sundays. So this is not a new thing. Um, and, uh, and it's been endorsed by our county council. Um, I'd ask for your favorable, um, uh, a favorable support, favorable report. And if I can answer any questions, please. Thank well, you. I'm going to first go to the uh, first two people who are signed up in favor of the bill, and then we'll entertain questions for the sponsor and the proponents, and then, of course, we'll get to the opponents. So uh, let me recognize James McKittrick with the DNR. Uh, James, are you in the... Are you in the... Hello. Oh, there you are. Okay, you got two minutes. Go for it. 
All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, James McKittrick, with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, uh, here in support of House Bill 325. Um, the reason we're here uh, in support, uh, you know, generally the department is, uh, strongly supports the self-determination of local jurisdictions to expand hunting opportunities uh, within the guardrails of the state and federal rules and regulations. Uh, you know, there is the position of the department also that hunting remains the most cost-effective method for controlling and managing the deer population throughout most of the state. Uh, Sunday hunting is important for expanding deer harvest op opportunities, um, especially given uh, that um, a lot of the folks who do hunt uh, work a five, uh, you know, work five days a week and only have Saturdays and Sundays open uh, to, to hunting. Um, you know, as the spill sponsor noted, there is already Sunday hunting authorized in Talbot County. Uh, this legislation, um, you know, as, as we've amended um, with, with the sponsor would, uh, would increase those opportunities. Um, and uh, we ask for a favorable committee report and happy to take any questions. Okay, also signed up in favor, Joseph Opal Opalski. Did I pronounce your name correctly, sir? You need to unmute yourself, sir. Uh, we still can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. It's a button on the lower left of your screen that has a little microphone that you need to. There you How's go. That? The, I can hear right. you now. Uh, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, yeah, Opalski. Thank you very much. Okay, go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and esteemed members of the committee. I would like to testify on behalf of um, House Bill 325 in support of that bill. I uh, testified last year in support of a similar bill, and, uh, and I'm, uh, my position was I'm the former director of Parks and Recreation for Talbot County, an archery instructor, and a uh, Maryland Safe Hunting instructor. Uh, the first thing is uh, there's conflict with the hunting schedules now between Talbot, Dorchester, and Caroline, and this would align those counties together. It creates confusion for the people that I mentor and for the Department of Natural Resources Police in that they have to deal with the conflict and that sometimes you can hunt and sometimes you can't. As a matter of fact, eight counties in the state allow unlimited, well, regular hunting on Sundays. Uh, last year I reported there were 44 states that allowed uh, hunting in the state on Sunday. Now there's 48. Um, <clears throat> and this is, as James had mentioned, is a cost-effective way to prevent hunting because it doesn't cost the act we actually paid on through licensing and taxes levied on Pittman Robertson, which is an 11% excise tax that's on uh, guns, bows and arrows and ammunition. That money is used to fund the wildlife uh, conservation programs in the state of Maryland, not using income tax or real estate tax, which uh, these established the Eastern Turkey, the wood duck and currently in quail restoration. Also, in archery, I see the face changing in that over half of my students are now um, females. So we have a whole different population. And I think one of the things I'm running out of time here that I wanna mention is that in maintaining the deer population, it also helps maintain Lyme's disease so that the more we can keep that population in balance, the more likely we are to control those diseases and afflictions that come through and transmitted by those animals. Thank you, and I hope you will support um, House Bill 325. Okay, we'll proceed to entertain questions for the sponsors and the, uh, uh, and the proponents. And it appears that the first question will go to Delegate Boyce, followed by Delegate Healy, Jacobs, and Gilchrist in that order. Delegate Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hi, uh, Delegate. I'd like to know between yourself and MDE, um, you said this was the same bill as last year for which we voted on. Can you tell me what the distinct difference is? You said it's slightly different this year and I'd like to vote on the same bill um, uh, if it is in the same posture, but um, you did mention public lands and I'm wondering was public and lands added? Yeah, no, exactly. So this bill is different in that respect. I believe, and I should know, and I'm, I'm, I, I believe that the public lands portion 
in this bill is different than last year's. And so it was added this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, um, and, that, and, and that's, and I wanted to make sure everyone is a very much aware of that. Tom County is unique to a lot of the counties on the, sh on the shore in that we only have one parcel of public hunting ground. Uh, it's named Seth Demonstration Forest. It's on the on the eastern side of the town of Easton and it's kind of surrounded by a, a, a development, a housing developments and things. I'm limited. It's only, um, only bow and arrow is allowed there uh, for deer hunting. 21 acres. Um, and uh, I, I've, I, it's, it makes sense to have it in there. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a step back, I'd also appreciate the argument that we need consistency. Um, I don't think that it would be necessarily um well, I can see how it would cause a problem with other areas, other counties neighboring counties that have large acreage of public ground um this set demonstration for us i think there there's about there's a handful of people that use it for hunting um, some of the other counties they have public hunting grounds that is attracted people from other states will come and travel to hunt there you know, as a policy matter, you know, doing the Sunday hunting, um, you, know, it, it, I, you know, it makes sense for Talbot because it's that one small, very regulated area. Um, but you have these other neighboring counties. I wanted to make sure that you guys uh, making your decision that you have the information because I, mean, I don't want to, I'd hate for us to create another problem down the road. I think that's been the effort is for everybody to work together to try to harmonize um, the best set of uh, rules for the hunting community and for the community in, in general. So you're including you. public lands. Yes, you're right. And when you say public, it's public hunting grounds or just public? If, if I may jump in here. So the Seth Demonstration Forest is part of the Chesapeake Forest Lands Network that exists across the Eastern Shore. Uh, those lands are reserved, uh, in this case, um, reserved specifically for public hunting. But again, it was not in the bill last year that we passed. Uh, the, I'll have to defer to the, the sponsor on that. Yeah. No, it was not. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, Delegate Healy. Uh, th thank you very much. I just want to understand, th this is actually a crucial question for me personally. Um, we had a bill here uh, from another county recently, and it was all on private land, and it had the full support of all the elected officials. Does this bill have full support of all the elected officials in the county involved? I think it was a, there was one, there was one negative vote. And um, was that related to it being on public land? I was, I couldn't speak for that person. I could find out for you and, and get back to you within in a short amount of time. And, and that's okay. I, I, I'm just curious about that. The, the main question, have is about uh, how this fits into the other counties on the Eastern Shore. Um, how many of the, of the other counties surrounding your county, it, which is in this bill, uh, how many of those counties uh, have Sunday hunting on public land? I, I think that uh, Mr. McKittrick from DNR can answer. Uh, probably uh, just the, the areas surrounding would be Dorchester um, with the uh, provision that it's only going to be for uh, turkey during the spring hunting season. So that's, uh, if you have the markup, it's going to be on page five of the markup. So the, let me just be clear that we understand the answer. You're saying that in Dorchester County, they allow turkey hunting on public land. Correct. On Sundays. Correct. On Sundays. Just out of curiosity, any other uh, counties where that's allowed? Uh, on the Eastern Shore, so I'll just run the whole list. So you have Allegheny, Cecil, Garrett, St. Mary's, Washington, and Frederick, although Frederick is only, uh, only for deer from the first Sunday to October through the second Sunday in January. So Dorchester and Cecil are on the shore? Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, Delegate Healy, uh, you still have the floor. Oh, uh, thank you. That, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay, Delegate Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Mr. Opaski, 
you uh, that you teach down there in the, I guess it's the Tri County areas, uh, Caroline, Talbot, Dorchester. Yes. And last year, I believe that you testified that you you had been teaching Mr. McKittrick, and he was unsuccessful in uh, in harvesting any deer. And isn't it true that the deer must be pretty thick down there this year because he's captured, he killed a, harvested a couple of them this year. So the, the deer are pretty plentiful in that area. Wouldn't you agree? Um, they are plentiful, sir. And um, he did not hit them with his car as may have been assumed. So he actually did learn something from class and, and was able to harvest a couple of deer by means of firearms. Yes, sir. So that just proves the deer are very thick in that area and justifies the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question goes to Delegate Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, James, this, this bill allows DNR to authorize these activities. Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's the way that, you know, the lawyers decided we should be drafting this statute. So yes, we do set every year set our, our uh, we have a rate package um, and, you know, we set the seasons out, uh, you know, depending, you know, on the, on the calendar, we set the dates. So, so I think the, the sponsors, the sponsor said that in this county, um, right now on the public lands, it would just be for bow hunting? Correct. And so Correct. DNR under this bill would have authority to do just that and more? On public lands, no. So the only, again, so the way this statute works is it says, you know, they're going to be authorizing Sunday hunting in Talbot County on public lands. However, it restricts, basically it restricts state parks. So there's no Sunday hunting in state parks. And so by default, the only open area for only public lands that are open in Talbot for hunting currently is the Seth Demonstration Forest which is part of the Chesapeake forest lands and therefore set aside for hunting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there any further questions for the sponsor or the proponents of the bill? Seeing none, we'll go to the opponents of the bill and they are uh, in the following order, uh, Betty Maki, uh, Joyce Bell, Christy Claggett, Rebecca Ellison, I believe uh, those four. So let's begin with Betty Maki. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, Betty. Betty, you will need to unmute yourself. It's the microphone icon at the lower left of the screen. All right. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear and see you. And please okay. start the okay, clock, um, okay, Uriel. Um, I'm against adding more Sundays to the deer hunting season. Um, I'm not against hunting and I understand the need to call deer. I'm not a hunter, but I am an outdoor enthusiast who's quite uneasy walking in a wooded area or across a meadow with the possibility of hunting, hunters being there. It's really nice to have some Sundays when no hunting is permitted. My husband and my son are deer hunters and they are uncomfortable when they see or hear non-hunters in the woods. It brings their hunting, hunting to an end as long as these people are there. Um, I live right next to Seth Demonstration Forest. The community I live in has 400 plus homes and a number of these homes back right up to Seth Forest. There are two entrances into these woods, one from our community and another at the opposite side with the entrance from a county road. People enjoy the tall canopy trees and the wide natural paths. People walk with their dogs, their grandchildren for themselves and a few horseback riders visit. This is a bow hunt designated area with five Sundays at this time. If the proposed law passes with more Sundays, aren't you concerned with hunter-citizen conflict? 
the average person is not aware of hunting seasons. The more days designated a hunting provides more possibility of conflict. Hunt Sunday is a day when most people have time to enjoy the outdoors. I'm a member of the 65 year old Talbot County Bird Club. We presently have 106 members. Our bird walks are on Sundays with few exceptions. And one of the reasons Sunday was chosen was to respect hunting on other days. Maryland has a full calendar of hunting. Please remember there are thousands of us who do not hunt and have a right to be in the same places as the hunters. Please do not add more Sunday hunting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bell, uh, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You can. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Joyce Bell. I live in Talbot and I oppose this bill. Talbot County already has seven Sundays reserved for hunters. This bill would add 10 more Sundays, creating 17, 17 uninterrupted weeks of hunting. The bill purports to be a huge economic engine that would attract hunters to Talbot County to hunt, but the legislative services fiscal note states the bill would not materially affect state or local finances and will have minimal overall impact on small businesses. From the, from the hunter I, hunters I talked to, unleased property to hunt is hard to find, so adding more Sundays might be for convenience only. An increase in Sunday hunting might even reduce spending by non-hunters who do make up 92% of Marylanders, according to a DNR survey. But even more important, an unintended consequence of hunting on your property might be that your neighbors have less use of their own property from dog walking to bird watching. Property lines in the woods are rarely marked, difficult to follow, and as is in the case behind our, our house where four properties come together. Many horse owners don't own horse trailers. Their own property is the only place they can ride or do business. Talisman Therapeutic Riding Center can't use their outdoor arena when their hunters neighbors are hunting. DNR hunting accident reports are woefully incomplete. I have lots of examples, but unfortunately not a lot of time. Brenda Kibler, a retired DNR officer was quoted in an article in the February 14 issue of the Star Democrat and I quote, DNR often was often short staffed and hunting accidents were common. There were constant hunting complaints. It was ridiculous. And Sunday is a hard day to enforce because officers need days off too. Ms. Kibler predicts DNR would be, be even more stretched if hunting is allowed on more Sundays. How many more accidents would there be if the perception of danger didn't keep so many Marylanders inside? And especially at a time when doctors in 34 states are praising the benefits of being outside in nature, even handing out green prescriptions. Please do give this bill an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, let's go to Christy Claggett of the Maryland Horse Council. Christy, uh, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Christy Claggett. I'm a resident of Harwood, Maryland, and a member of the Legislative Committee of the Maryland Horse Council. The Maryland Horse Council opposes horse, House Bill 325. We oppose the expansion of Sunday hunting. We do not oppose hunting. We support the maintaining of one day per week for the non-hunting outdoor recreation. We stand for equitable sharing of the natural resources. A majority of Marylanders oppose Sunday hunting. In 2018, Gonzales research poll showed 68% of Marylanders opposed Sunday hunting. There is no urgent need to increase Sunday hunting. DNR says the deer population has stabilized at 200,000 and has reduced bag limits. Sunday hunting statistically shows that Sunday hunting does not increase the overall kill, it just increases the number killed on Sunday. So hunters want the convenience of Sunday hunting. The statement that sometimes they say that children need to be able to get access on Sundays, well, non-hunting children also need access to the outdoors on Sundays. The Maryland Horse Council is a membership-based umbrella trade association of the entire horse industry, and we represent over 30,000 Marylanders. Maryland is unique with its po horse population. We have more horses per square mile than any other state, 101,000 horses in this state. So the recreational sector of our horse industry is large. It's a $382 million uh, impact, and trails are between public and private wandering through that and nobody really knows where the boundaries are. So you are causing a problem between hunters and users of the great outdoors. 
please do not pass this bill. Please oppose hunting on Sundays increasing in Talbot County. Thank you very much. Uh, and next we will go to Rebecca Ellison. Rebecca, are you in the house? Rebecca, Ms. Ellison? She's in the meeting, um, but she just has video and microphone off. Okay, well, I'm gonna to go to questions. Are there any questions for the opponents to this bill? Uh, uh, Chairman Brevet, her microphone is now on. You wanna- Okay, then let's go to uh, Ms. Ellison. Uh, Ms. Ellison, uh, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Ms. Ellison. Uh, I don't know what to do. If she, if she can't testify and nobody has any questions, I'm going to have to move on to the next bill. So that's what I'm going to do. That concludes the public hearing on House Bill 325. Let me ask if the Attorney General is present so that we can do House Bill 739. Trish, is, he in the, is the Attorney General around? Uh, not yet. Okay, so we'll we'll um, we'll skip over seven thirty nine, and we will go to House Bill seven fifty five from our new delegate from Western Maryland, whose last name I don't know how to properly pronounce. So, delegate, if you could tell me how to correctly pronounce. Your name, I'll be happy to introduce you. I'll be honored to to help you pronounce my name. <laughs> it's pronounced Cham. Cham, okay. Yes, this is, uh, delegate, Cham. Uh, delegate uh, Cham, and uh, Delegate, you have four yes. minutes. You'll see the top timer go through two minutes, two times. So, Thank um, you. Welcome to the Environment and Transportation Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with all of you, to uh, Chairman and to the Vice Chair. My name is uh, Brenda Cham, Delegate Brenda Cham. It's an honor to be speaking with you today to present my bill uh, 755 that would lower the disability threshold for a Maryland, free Maryland anglers license via the Maryland Department of Natural Resources from 100% service related disability rating to an 80% veteran service related um, disability rating. It is my request to you and all of the committee that this bill should be giving a favorable vote. Many disabled Maryland veterans suffer from a vast array of medical conditions, both physically and mentally. Not all of these serious conditions warrant a 100% disability rating from the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs. My bill seeks to empower a greater number of disabled veterans in Maryland who, if given the opportunity, may benefit in a therapeutic way from a free Maryland angler's license. It is my wish that the Maryland Anglers License could provide an opportunity for our disabled veterans to experience an activity that quiets and centers the mind, especially in today's world of increasing veteran suicides across the United States. It is my hope that such free license would encourage our eligible disabled veterans in Maryland to take advantage of our state's premier fishing locations and many of our state parks, state rivers, and of course, along our Chesapeake Bay. During the pandemic last year, I can say without a doubt that being outside, getting some fresh air, walking my dog Zeus was essential in my own mental health and peace of mind. It is my firm belief that our seriously disabled veterans living in Maryland should be offered the opportunity to embark on a noble pursuit of better living and communing with nature. This pursuit could be enhanced in a closer and more personal way by having a free Maryland Angler's License. I solicit your vote today and with a favorable outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. No one has signed up to testify. Uh, the, there's lots of written testimony in favor. Yes. No testimony against. I do have to ask you though, Delegate Cham, what breed is Zeus? 
<laughs> it's a Labrador. It's a three-year-old lab. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, joy and excitement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Delegate Gilk has a question. Sure. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And welcome, Delegate Cham. Thank you. We've, we've had bills to um, give complimentary licenses to like, all veterans and, and to Purple Heart. And, and one of the compromises we reached in the past was the 100% was the disabled uh, that you have in law now. So a lot of the hunting um, funding comes from hunters getting these licenses and there's a special fund to allow the regulation of hunting in the state. So I'm just wondering how, how why should why should the law and, and sometimes also I might add we, we uh, give discounted prices on a license. So I'm just wondering how should the committee weigh all these issues? Right. I had several disabled veterans reach out to me um, right around the end of the year. And all of them, I can uh, can't name them all, but it was it was more than more than ten, probably more than twenty, and all of them were more interested in the fishing license. Um, so they uh, encouraged me that when I came to Annapolis in January when the session started to consider them and to look at lowering the percentage rate of disability, um, so that they may be able to. Um, uh, you know, get the, the free Maryland complimentary license for fishing. Some of them are, are um, like I said, disabled veterans and struggling with various disabilities, but enjoy fishing with their friends and family and, and grandkids. So just with that information and doing some research, um, I just, I felt that this was something that uh, I, I needed to pursue as my first bill to present to colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further questions for Delegate Chan? Seeing none, uh, again, welcome to the committee, Delegate, and forward to seeing you in the future. And with Thank that, you. I will conclude the public hearing on House Bill 755. Um, no Attorney General, I believe, so we will go to House Bill 799, Delegate Clark. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you, committee, for hearing my uh, bill today. I bring you House Bill 799 today, which is the Aquaculture Leash and Selfish Operations Wetland Bill. Uh, you all may be familiar and remember back in 2019, I had a similar bill that allowed uh, the uh, water pipes to be able to run across piers for uh, spat operations on oyster culture things. And it cleared up um, a disagreement between DNR, MDE, and the Board of Public Works to allow them to do it. Uh, something to that, new technology and different ways of doing things in the industry have evolved. And the uh, oyster culture folks uh, asked me to cross file, uh, along with uh, Senator Klausmeyer, uh, this bill to uh, help them to be able to embrace the new technology. Um, supplement to that, the bill was cross-filed in the Senate, Senate Bill 442, and it was already heard there. Uh, and um, it has been amended. And if you look in the notes and testimony, there's an amendment that we put in for that bill. Um, the, um, as I said here, looking at my screen, he's showing the, the, my uh, PowerPoint for the next bill, uh, 800 instead of 799. Uh, something to that, the whole bill has been uh, changed around and the uh, Senate um, side has uh, asked for this to be uh, diverted to oyster culture uh, committee uh, to do a summer study and come back with recommendations. So uh, I'm not sure how, Mr. Chairman, you would want to uh, proceed with this. Uh, I would like to go ahead and um, well, do we what. <laughs> well, we got uh, one, two people signed up in favor, nobody against. Why don't we call on them uh -huh. and then we'll entertain questions. Is that okay, Delegate Clark? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's start with uh, Dave 
Sikorsky, I want to say, from the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance. Dave, are you with us? Hello, Dave. Well, let's go to uh, Patrick Hudson. Maybe Dave will show up. Mr. Hudson. Uh, I just let him in from the waiting room. Okay, is uh, which one, uh, Hudson? Uh, Patrick, Patrick Hudson. Okay, uh, Mr. Hudson, are you with us? Please begin. You have two minutes. Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you and you have two minutes. Welcome to the committee. Hi, uh, first time with this, so um, kind of baptism by fire here, but um, thanks for uh, having me today. Um, my name is Patrick Hudson. I'm the uh, owner of True Chesapeake Oyster Co. Um, and we're trying to, you know, uh, grow oysters, feed people, create jobs um, in Southern Maryland. And there's been a dispute between uh, DNR and MDE that's been hampering us for the last um, several years, many years, and uh, it's just made it really difficult to plan and operate. Um, and both uh, MDE and DNR have had uh, quite some time to come to a resolution. And um, uh, that's why we um, asked for a, uh, you know, their inability to come to a resolution is, is why we asked for a legislative fix. Um, not looking for an unfair advantage, um, just looking for the clarity um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're hardworking, reasonable folks, uh, have a lot of respect for both MDE and DNR and what they do. And, and, uh, um, you know, they're, they're critical. Both, both agencies are really critical to the success of the, uh, oyster aquaculture industry in Maryland. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're asking that, um, DNR, uh, be given the authority to uh, take the lead on this particular issue and sort of resolve uh, the issue about the, the use of uh, equipment. Um, and I've submitted some written testimony to clarify some of that. And besides that, I think uh, that's, that's all the time I need. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, you seem familiar to me. Have you come and testified before us before? A long, long time ago, <laughs> I, I, okay. I remember going to the, the, you know, back in the, back in the day when we used to do this in person. Okay. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, let me see if Dave Sikorsky is around with the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance. Dave, are you with us? Is Dave with us? Well. Apparently not. So do we have any questions for either Delegate Clark or uh, Patrick Hudson on the committee? Okay, we appear not to have, uh, Charles, do you have a question? So yes, you thank you. I didn't get my hand up quick enough. Okay, well, there, go ahead. Uh, uh, Delegate, you talked about uh, new technology and this, that, and the other. Uh, so we're going digital or marking these boundaries or, or what? Or that's the next. That was that, confusion with the next bill. Right? Yeah, that's the next bill. This is a, uh, this is just has to do with uh, with tumblers and different things that they want to use on piers. And it, it, there is some emerging technology, and uh, the the Senate uh, in the Senate hearing, uh, the uh, Oyster Culture Coordinating Council, uh, uh, had, they decided to have them uh, do a study on that this summer and come up with some more clear reg, uh, regulations that'll settle this once and for all so that going forward a little forward thinking and uh so we don't have to keep coming back with this kind of stuff sounds good okay um just for the sake of information for the committee uh dnr has offered written testimony in favor and no one is opposed so oh delegate healy go ahead ask your question Gotta unmute yourself, Ann. All right, thank you. Um, my question is about the, the DNR testimony. Um, delegate, um, have you looked at that? Have you, because they're, um, I think they want some amendments. 
Well, I I I think that um, that uh, the their amendments and what's going on there is kind of mute because uh, you know the Senate has you know basically I, I don't think they withdrew the bill, but they you know they, all the folks that that participated in that uh, hearing decided that the best thing to do was to send it to the Aquaculture Coordinating Council for review and to bring back at a later date to uh, to clean it all up. So I think they would probably be better looking at amendments once all that's done, as opposed to uh, uh, amendments to this bill that uh, uh, that probably won't matter one way or the other. Because uh, you know I I go along with the amendments from the Senate. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? And if not, uh, thank you very much. That concludes the public hearing on House Bill 799. Let's go to House Bill 800, Delegate Clark. Okay, Mr. Chairman, let me get my another book out. Okay. Uh, thank is you. This, is this the bill that you're going to have a PowerPoint on? Yes. Uh, Trish knows about this. Yeah, if, if you could go ahead and start that. This is House Bill uh, 800. And this bill is for aquaculture leases, marking and recording requirements on a mobile app. And it also is a benefit to recreational fishermen and uh, crabbers and just uh, boaters in general. Uh, the reason for this bill is uh, uh, last year I had a bill that made some changes to aquaculture uh, markers and um, uh, and in leases and different things. And uh, the bill was successful. So uh, a couple of years ago, I ran into this app that is in Virginia, uh, that Virginia has, it shows all the uh, 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 oyster culture leases, all the Yates bars, all the AV zones, all the fixed fishing things. We had public fishery advisory areas, uh, shellfish areas, I mean, you can see it all on on the uh, the screen. The next, if you could go to the next slide, uh, and the reason this is uh, this is all in your comments also. So if you get an opportunity to download this and look at it, it would be appreciated, and you you'd see how uh, how much it would mean to be able to do this. So uh, having worked with James McKendrick uh, a couple of years to try to get this done, and and the secretary James a year or so ago made a wise. A statement to me and say probably the best way to get this done is to put in a bill. Well, James, I, I put in the bill. Uh, I noticed that uh, DNR uh, only came across with informational, uh, but on the, my last bill, they were favorable. So I guess if they're favorable on one and informational on the other, that means they might have a little uh, indigestion about this one. Uh, but this bill, it, 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 I think is very important. It would help uh, not just uh, the oyster culture people, but the commercial uh, oystermen know where they're at, where they shouldn't be. It'll show the uh, clamming areas. It'll show the SAV areas, the where uh, uh, they shouldn't be messing with the uh, with the uh, submerged vegetation. Matter of fact, there's today there's an all day uh, uh, Zoom meeting about SAV that's taking place right now and how important it is. So this app kind of builds right into it with EPA. Um, it also would allow recreational fisher fishermen to be able to go out and if they find a, a good honey hole where they're catching a lot of fish, to be able to pin it on their phone. And um, same thing with crabbing. And um, I just think it's a big plus as we move forward in the technology age, and just like we are looking at digitizing uh, hunting licenses and fish, different things out there, this is just a, a natural progression uh, to help the, the, everybody from it's a win-win situation. Uh, you can see all the different uh, areas that you can go into on the apps. Uh, it breaks it down. This, this is for Virginia, but we could duplicate this in Maryland and uh, and it, it's just a plus plus and a win. Uh, we could see all the, the markings for public grounds and next one, um, the, the blue crab sanctuaries, the 
down the nation zones. We'd be able to mark off all the oyster sanctuaries where people shouldn't be. Uh, next one. And uh, open harvest areas and different uh, uh, areas uh, that are, you know, released to people and things like that. Uh, I just think that DNR needs a little bit of a push to get this done. Um, you know, they're going to tell you about a fiscal note of a hundred and some thousand dollars. Well, you know, if we can save uh, 10 watermen from losing their, uh, their living for their lifetime for being in the wrong area or recreational fishermen from being out there and getting caught catching rockfish in the wrong place or at the wrong time or the wrong length, because all the regulations should be on this website. Uh, I think it's worth that to the uh, citizens of Maryland for us to be able to put this in place and make okay. it Okay, well, your time's up, uh, 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 Delegate Clark. Let me recognize Colby Ferguson, followed by Allison Colden, and then we'll go to questions. So, Colby. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of uh, Maryland Farm Bureau, and um, <clears throat> we support this bill. Um, one thing I like about this bill is when I read it the first time, it was uh, right around the time I was working with uh, Delegate Boyce on trying to help um, address some of the concerns within the aquaculture theft bill that she has. And um, this would go a long ways in, in really trying to clean up when people don't know where they're supposed to not be. And uh, really, that's how it comes to the comes comes down to it. Um, if this app was available, uh, you could be out uh, out on the water. You could actually pull it up where you are because it's GPS um, identified, and you would determine whether you're in a a public fishery area if you're on a sanctuary, and um, you know really take us into the 21st century instead of just assuming am I on a lease, am I not on a lease. Um, this would help a lot of those excuses of. Well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be there. So I'll keep it short and sweet. We think this is a good bill. Um, um, I, looking at it, it's not a full pin. It's a contractual employee that uh, just to build out the, the app uh, initially for DNR. So hope we would move this bill, bill forward. Thank you, Thank Colby. You. Is um, uh, Allison Colden out there? Allison? Okay, well, I'll, I'll go to questions, and if she turns up, we'll uh, recognize her. The first question goes to Delegate Ruth, and then the next to Jay Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, as, a, as a programmer, I am confess to being a bit of a tech geek, and so when I was looking at your slides last night, I was very excited by this. I think this is a, a terrific idea. Um, uh, so, so Virginia has an app that does this. Would we have to then develop, would DNR have to develop an app? To, to well, my, my suggestion was that they they contact uh, Virginia and see just, uh, you know, if they have the app that we can convert our data into. Uh, I got some feedback from DNR that they weren't that uh, impressed with Virginia's app, which, you know, I, I'm sure that's natural. You know, everybody wants to do the better mousetrap. Uh, but uh, I think it's a starting point. And if we can do it more economically by, you know, using an app out of Virginia to get it started, I think that's probably the right way to go. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, uh, that would be a decision for DNR, unless you would like to build the app. Being your <laughs> <tech>. <laughs> It, I, if only I had the time, but, but thank you. That was actually what I was wondering is if we could consult with Virginia as a, as a starting point, but thank I you. Think, I think that'd be a good question for James McKendricks. <laughs> thank well, you. It's a shame he's not signed up. Uh, <laughs> uh, Delegate Jacobs and then Delegate Harrison in that order. Uh, good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First of all, Delegate Clark, I think it's a great bill. And, and you know, we a couple of days ago, we we approved a bill that uh, allowed uh, recreational licenses on, on phones. So I think we're, we're heading in that direction. I think that is where we are today in, in the world of technology. Um, I wish that, that James McKittrick was on here because I'd like to see where he got his numbers from when it says... Uh, uh, mobile application development, $100,000. I like to know whether that's a guess or if that's based on 
real numbers, you know, but in any event, you know, I think that, that the technology does take a little bit of investment, but in the words of the, our former Speaker of the House, I think the juice is worth the squeeze in this particular case. Um, you know, to have an app that that would be very information, the, the information on that app would be very important and and uh, and and provide a great deal of of, uh, of of real data to both recreational and commercial guys. And I can't see why they couldn't share with Virginia and and, and at least get something started. You know, you don't have to build the the world in one day. You got to start with uh, you know, with the first piece. So, I isn't like that so? <laughs> Isn't that so, Mr. Uh, Delegate Clark? <laughs> yes, it is so, and um, I, I believe that uh, that uh, of having had some conversations with people in the department, that the data is there and all the information is there. It's just a matter of putting it in into a, uh, an app. However, that's done. I'd be lying if I said I knew how to do that, but uh, seems like uh, to, to coordinate with the Virginia people would be a good idea. Perhaps we can meet with the DNR and, and get get a crunch down on these numbers, see what see where they're really coming from, and uh, maybe the committee will see fit to, to pass this good piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I recognize Delegate Harrison, we have so many new members in this committee uh, since the last election. I have to tell you this funny story about uh, David Frazier Adago had this bill in to uh, help start up the hemp industry. And the Department of Ag came up with a fiscal note that said it would be a million and a half dollars to do the testing uh, for this. And I uh, called up my boss in Rockville and said, uh, hey, uh, what does it cost to do uh, testing for marijuana? And she said, oh, that's $83. So I'm not saying DNR is doing that in this case. <laughs> it's, always, it's always good to get underneath the numbers. And with that, let me introduce, uh, I recognize Delegate Harrison. Oh, my. Yeah, it's always interesting how numbers are um, how they come about. Um, but speaking of numbers, just looking at the fiscal note and the amount, of course, it's increasing. But um, the question that I have is um, one, it, it's three questions in one. One, does um, Virginia charge um, for, um, for their application, their mobile app? Two, couldn't we charge for our mobile app? And three, do you think that it could be wrapped up into the licensing fee? So what I forget what the licensing fee is now for um, for like for, for fishing, but you know you add a few extra dollars on it. Couldn't that make up for some of the expenditures that um, that um, is listed in this fiscal note? Uh, the answer to that is one: Virginia doesn't charge; it's free to download. Uh, I have it on my phone. The secretary of DNR has it on her phone from a couple of years ago when I showed it to her the first time. Uh, so, and if you look at the slides, you could download it and look at it too. Uh, the second question, uh, would we want to, uh, to charge for it? I'm not sure that we would want to do that. I think that it not just serves as a service for the people, but it also would help for where people to know where they're at and where they shouldn't be. And by doing that, it would make the uh, DNR police officers jobs a lot easier and being able to enforce things. And uh, their third question, uh, what was the third part? I can't, uh, my, look, I'm getting old. I can't remember three questions at once. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting old too and I asked the three questions. <laughs> 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 but you, but, but I, I guess I was just trying to see. There seems to be some concern with the cost. I was just really trying to see how we might <coughs> offset those costs um, if if it's really that big of a deal. Now, as a relatively new fishing enthusiast, um, you know, I would love to have something like that if I could figure out how to use it. <laughs> relatively well, new. I thought you've been doing this since you were a little girl. What's this all? Well, I have, but I've never used technology. I just, you know, threw something out there. Okay. 
but I'm getting better and I'm actually out on boats. And so I've seen how you can, you know, do use a GPS to find other stuff. And I think that this is actually a great idea considering all that I've learned since being on this wonderful committee. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I was just trying to see if there's a way that we could offset the cost if that was truly um, an issue. Well, uh, Delia, I, I believe that we, it could probably be done less expensively. Uh, I think it's something we, we need to do. I tried for two years to get this app developed without having to put in uh, legislation for it. Uh, but uh, a year or so ago, when uh, the representative from DNR finally fessed up and said, no, anyway, you're probably going to get this and put it in legislation, I was just waiting for this year to do it. So, um, you know, I think we cr to create some funding somewhere if we have to, but it's like Jay said, it, it's, it's worse to push because it'll, it'll be beneficial to a lot of people. Okay, uh, Delegate Love has a question. Mr. Chair, actually I don't, but I've noticed that Delegate Celebrity has been trying to wave. So I raised oh. your hand to flag that for you for him. Oh, thank you. I hadn't noticed that. Uh, Delegate Celebrity, do you have a question or a comment? Well, yes, I don't do thank comments. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Clark, you know, I'm a city guy, but I do understand crabs and shellfish and all that stuff. But what is Yates bars? Y-A-T-E-S-B-A-R-S. It, 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 the way I understand it, that's where there, there's oysters, where there's mapped out oyster areas. It, Jay, oh. you're better at explaining that than I am in Yates bars. If, if uh, Delegate uh, Jacobs could explain, give you a more formal definition. I'll allow it. If the, what, uh, <laughs> yeah, there are, in fact, uh, historic oyster bars. And I'm going to have a little backroom talk with you fellas. See you. <laughs> okay. The fix well, is in. All right. Any further um, questions for um, the sponsor or the uh, proponents? Seeing none. Totally ignored. That <laughs> totally ignored. Okay. Okay. That we'll we'll go free. have a Coca Cola and uh, discuss what a Yates bar is. All right. Excellent, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, bringing this to my attention, but also thank you, Sarah, for, for helping me out here. I appreciate that. You're very welcome, Delegate. We all, all right. need a little help occasionally. Okay. Moving on. Moving We're on. hearing on House Bill 800. Uh, I have to ask, is the Attorney General in the, uh, uh, in the meeting room, uh, Trish? Not yet. I do have his witnesses ready to go, but... Uh, yeah, I know... Yet. I noticed them turning up. So, okay, we'll go to House Bill 807, Delegate Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Nice to see you all again. Um, uh, I'll be very brief on this bill. As you know, last interim, I participated in the chair's work group on waste and recycling. Um, as we went through the discussions, we heard from a number of counties things that they would have um, that they would like to see included in the Maryland Recycling Act. So Chair Barve, Work Group Chair Learman, and myself uh, put together a letter that we sent to Secretary Grumbles that said, please review this um, and let us know your thoughts on these amendments so we can draft legislation. And the Secretary responded laying out his thoughts or his, his department's thoughts on those amendments and um, the difficulty that putting those amendments in would cause. And then in other conversations, I realized that it made a lot more sense to just pull the lens back and make sure that the MRA is doing what we want it to do. Um, and so hence we have a bill for a task force. And with that, I request a favorable report, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll, uh, uh, we'll recognize the one, two, three people who've signed up in favor of the bill, and then we'll entertain questions. The first is um, Adam Ortiz. Uh, Adam, are you in the house? Chairman, I'm in the house. Okay, welcome. Two minutes, dude. Uh, thank you, my friend. Uh, good to see you, sir, and uh, other members of the committee. It's great to be back uh, in front of all of you and to continue uh, one of our favorite conversations on recycling. Um, first, I just want to applaud 
uh, you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Delegate Love, um, uh, the Vice Chairman, and all the others who participated in the uh, summer work group. A lot of input was shared, and I know that there's a lot to do. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I get text messages from you regularly um, <laughs> when you're at home asking, is this recyclable? Is that recyclable? What bin does that go in? Welcome those questions. And that kind of underscores why we're here today. Um, the recycling systems that we operate in, Mr. Chairman, um, function, um, but as we know, they are not always optimal. Uh, we're not always um, recycling the right things. Uh, manufacturers are not always prioritizing recyclable material, and we don't always count and incentivize uh, material that's being diverted. Uh, there was, uh, you know, I won't go through the comments and the findings of the work group per se. You have those on record. Um, but there's a lot of suggestions about how we can tighten up uh, the, the Maryland Recycling Act. Um, it was passed in 1988. That's more than 30 years ago. Um, it was groundbreaking at the time and it guides all of us on our work. But you know, it's time to, as the sponsor said, you know, zoom out a little bit, take a wider view and see how it can be uh, updated and modernized for the challenges that we face uh, today. You know, importantly, you know, in addition to zooming out, it's important to have the right people at the table. Um, MDE does a fantastic job. They've been a partner um, with us at the local level for a long time. They answer a lot of questions. They deal with a lot of work, but I'm sure they would welcome as much input as possible. And all of that is detailed in uh, the text of the legislation. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me join you today. Thank you, Delegate Love. And I'm available to answer any questions, should there be any. Yeah, I'm doing that all the time. I'll see something that I don't know if it can actually be recycled. I'll take a picture of it. I'll text it to Adam and within a couple of hours, he'll say, yeah, definitely send that to the incinerator. Uh, <laughs> um, next up, uh, Pam Casemeyer. Pam, welcome back. Hi, uh, Mr. Chair, Matt, uh, members of the committee, Pam Casemeyer here on behalf of the Maryland Delaware Solid Waste Association, which is essentially the private sector side of the waste industry in the state. And we're here also in support of this legislation. I think as Mr. Ortiz says, it's been a significant period of time before we actually looked at the language of the Maryland Recycling Act. And as this committee has been very active in a very positive way, looking at ways we can enhance, expand, um, improve upon our recycling efforts. I think a component part of that is the structure of the Maryland Recycling, recycling Act itself. And I think as uh, Mr. Ortiz said, the membership of the task force that's uh, reflected in the bill, I think pulls all the appropriate um, component parts together. And on behalf of our membership, we're looking forward um, to working with everyone to see if there's ways that revising the act could meet some of the objectives you all have been working on for a while now. Okay, thank you very much. Next, let's recognize Alex Butler on behalf of MAKO, who's testifying in favor. Alex? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Alex Butler with the Maryland Association of Counties here in full support of House Bill 807. Uh, I'll be very brief as the rest of the panel outlines some really great points on the bill. Uh, counties are central players in recycling and waste reduction efforts, uh, working to reach the outlined goals for the state. We think it's worthwhile to make periodic updates to improve uh, the efficiency uh, and the relevance of the uh, MRA. And this bill establishes a task force to do just that. Uh, we appreciate the local government participation outlined in the bill and look forward to being meaningful participants. Um, so with that, thank you to the sponsor and thank you to the committee for your efforts and consideration. Okay, uh, first question goes to Delegate Healy, second to Delegate Harrison. Uh, okay, uh, Delegate, I just looking quickly at the list of the membership of the task force. Um, is, I, I don't know the names of some of these organizations and who they actually represent. So maybe you could tell me, um, is the industry also represented on the task force? Um, multiple industries are represented. I just want to highlight that that Pam is here. I don't know that Pam and I have ever been on the same side of a bill. So I noticed that. <laughs> I noticed that, but I, I would just yeah. wonder. If, I don't. I. I mean, you know, they have different names for organizations. Can right. you point out like which ones represent various industries or or parts of the those folks too? Um, 
Well, on the Maryland Recycling Network, I mean, Pam sits on that, that has various industry representatives as well as mm -hmm. I believe Adam's on that as well. Um, and so that's, that's already, that's oh, yeah. already and broadly then, representative, you know, yeah. The um, Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority and okay. Maryland chapter of the National Waste and Recycling Association, there are a number of industry folks in there. Okay. Uh, so they are represented. The, the one thing actually that was flagged to me um, is that there are no environmental groups on there, um, which is an interesting question. I had been thinking those, about those who um, really implement the act when right. I drafted it. And that, that, that was really where my question was going to <laughs> talk about the practical side of how would this get done? And if you're really looking to upgrade, it's, it's philosophical. It's also the actual nuts and bolts of what can work and what can't with the current technology. So thank you so much. Thank you. And and I didn't want it to go without saying, I, I also appreciate um, Alex coming in and supporting and, and always um, Adam is amazing. So I want to thank all three of my witnesses. For well, Adam is very special because he's my constituent. <laughs> okay, uh, Delegate Harrison. Hey, thank you. Um, and I just noticed that, um, that the task force should be completed their work basically by December 1st of this year. And I'm, I guess everyone believes that this can be done in that amount of time to, and then to, I guess, have recommendations that would, um, yeah, the recommendations that will come forward. So you I think, think that's the goal. And Certainly, if they need more time at that point, they can ask for more time, but the goal would be that they could get it done within the year um, and submit. And I guess that's because, you know, pretty much everything is in place and what you're really doing is looking to see how, see what needs to be strengthened so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, I think it's it's that, um, and I think these the people that we have on this are experts in this. They do this every day, and they have ideas, and it's just a matter of bringing them all together and hammering out what makes the most sense. But you know, Adam can certainly speak to that, and Pam and Alex better than I can. Um, just a, the last question is: um, Do you think that it might be prudent to have? someone um, from from the industry that actually does the recycling. Um, I can't go back and forth between my screens and, and, and make sure that I can be heard on uh, to unmute myself and look at the at the bill. I can't scroll back right now, but I was just wondering, um, would it be prudent to have someone, um, and if it's not already there, someone from the recycling industry? Pam, did you wanna handle that? Is that why your hand's up? Yeah, um, Delegate Harrison, and thanks again to Delegate Love um, for the composition. The Maryland Recyclers Network is a combination of the public sector and the private sector, focus a lot on and includes actual recyclers. The, the Maryland chapter of the National Waste and Recycling Committee does as well, and then the local jurisdictions and the Northeast Waste Disposal Authority, they, all of them have some ownership or responsibility with existing recycling frameworks. That answer your question? Okay, uh, any further questions for anyone on this uh, bill? Nobody signed up in opposition. Alrighty then, uh, thank you very much. That ends the public hearing on House Bill 807. Um, do we have an attorney general with us yet? Negative. So much for my theory of having the bill heard early, so we're all fresh. Okay, we'll go to House Bill 831, Delegate Charcutian. Thank you, Mr. Hello. Chair. Hello. Okay. Sorry, am I good? Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Sure. Um, uh, members of the Environment and Transportation Committee, Delegate Charcutian here uh, speaking on behalf of House Bill 831, Maryland Food System Resiliency Council. Um, many of us, uh, and some including many of you, have been working for years on building, building a resilient local food system. Um, and as we've been doing this, we have talked about a number of really crucial areas. We've talked about the importance to the economy, to farmland preservation, to the environment, to food security, to equity, and, to an, and we have been talking about emergency preparedness. 
I think even in those conversations that we've been having for years, we had no idea what this pandemic would look like from the perspective of this emergency and what it would look like in terms of our food system. And what COVID did was it magnified the flaws in our food system, which had always been there, um, but just had a much more damaging impact on our communities and on, and on, on community members. So we saw, we saw, we continue to see heartbreakingly long lines at food distribution sites. We saw supply chain issues. We saw hungry people and food being plowed under and thrown away. We saw uh, people in food deserts even more hard hit than, than, than uh, the, the regular uh, suffering in food deserts because uh, transit, people were more afraid to ride transit. Um, and we saw smaller food businesses, value added and restaurants struggling and closing. And we know that the social determinants of health, which made the pandemic worse for some communities than others, are often tied to diet and an ability to get a healthy diet. So we saw all those connections in COVID. We also saw some really creative um, efforts in COVID. So we saw farmers who shifted from uh, collecting from multiple small farmers to sell to restaurants, shifting to delivering to people's front porches. I know a farmer that I work with uh, did that very successfully and Marbidco supported a lot of those efforts with grant funds. We saw volunteers collecting food from grocery stores and food rescue and distributing it to hungry people. We saw uh, programs that bought meals from restaurants to help the restaurants stay open and distribute to hungry people. But the other thing that we saw was just how siloed our food response systems are. So when the Federal Farm to Food Bank program came out, many, many Maryland small farmers were not able to access that money because of the requirements that came with it. In Maryland, we had another shot. I worked with uh, Senator Katie Fry Hester trying to get access to some of the CARES money that would have supported building the distribution system, farm to food bank, and eventually farm to large institution. We weren't able to access those funds because of the siloed nature of many of our state agencies. And if you read the fiscal note, um, it actually lists a lot of our food security efforts and you'll see that they are in separate agencies. And while everyone in those agencies, I believe is very well meaning and works very hard, they don't necessarily coordinate so that we are both responding to the food crisis, but also doing it in a way that is building out our local economy, supporting local farmers, um, building equity into it, developing long term solutions that are good for the environment um, and for our economy. So um, what we saw across the state, though, is that in different areas that had food councils, and my, most of my experience is in Montgomery County, although there were strong food councils in Prince George's and Baltimore, other parts of the state as well. In the areas with the food councils, there was a much more coordinated, creative effort that worked across those silos, that worked to feed members of our community in a way that also supported farmers, supported small businesses, supported the local food system, supported equity, um, and so what this tells us is that we can respond to food resiliency needs in a way that is breaks down these silos, coordinates the efforts. And that's what this council uh, is designed to do to support bringing that creativity and that coordination so that the, the, sum, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Um, I see my time is up. Uh, great speakers coming after me and I'm happy to take questions either before or after they speak. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Delegate. Uh, is there a order for the witnesses that you'd like to have them called? Or should I, is uh, Mr. Lance the, the first witness? I, I think, um, yeah, whatever, I, any, any order is fine. Okay, Willie Lance. Yes, <clears throat> yes, hello. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Willie Lance. I chair the uh, Western Maryland Food Council, which is located in Garrett, Allegheny and Washington counties. Um, I helped actually form the Western Maryland Food Council and got involved in the uh, food system work uh, to increase the sustainability of local foods. Um, I'm a farmer here in uh, Garrett County, uh, mostly working in the uh, fresh fruit and vegetable side of the uh, agriculture. Um, well, one of the, while we are in one of the most rural counties in Maryland, um, we've done some work to try to estimate the amount of local foods that's actually produced in the county and consumed in the county um, based on USD estimates of how much people spend on uh, food each year and what we sell through farmers markets and various other uh, avenues that we could identify uh, still less than 1% uh, 
of our local food comes from uh, people within the county to serve the people of the county. So, um, and when we look at the state of Maryland and look at the agriculture output, uh, it's about $2.4 billion, uh, but people in Maryland spend over $24 billion on uh, food each year. Uh, all this leads us up to thinking about the idea that a majority of the food that's produced here in Maryland uh, leaves the state to be processed and then uh, some of that food might come back, but we rely on uh, other states for food processing. As was mentioned earlier, um, you know, it wasn't until the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that I think most of us realized how uh, fragile uh, the food system is, how dependent we are on uh, trucking, how dependent we are on uh, processing, how timely uh, some of the ideas of being able to slaughter animals and get those animals moved through the uh, food system is to uh, making sure there's food uh, on the shelves. In many cases, uh, it was only a few days before uh, food was becoming short in, in certain areas. And just Sir, like if you could, if you could wrap up, please. Okay. Uh, basically, I you know would like you all to support this bill, and uh, thank you all for uh, considering it. Thank you. Uh, next, Colby Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson, on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. Um, and we come in support of this bill. I think uh, 2020 uh, had multiple areas that we found uh, the food issue concern, uh, not only from uh, just not having the shackle space at the at the, the local processing facilities because it was such a high demand for, for local meats, uh, but then when we started to look into the food bank or to the food uh, uh, procurement process that uh, that was rolled out in the CARES, CARES funding. Uh, we had a lot of farmers that were not allowed or were not able to participate in that program. Uh, and it really became down, came down to there just wasn't a unified system that it could all flow through. It was really just, you know, whoever had the, the right lawyer at the right time that could that could submit the application on time got got into the system and and the rest of us um, basically watched that that funding go right through the Right, right around us. And so uh, this bill, we, we appreciate that the sponsor of the bill has uh, Maryland Farm Bureau as one of the uh, uh, council members. And um, we would definitely uh, make sure we put a priority on this, uh, this, this food council. We, we firmly believe that addressing food insecurities, particularly in the uh, food desert areas, uh, in the urban areas is, is somewhere that, that really needs to be addressed. We talk about it year after year after year but nothing ever gets done. And um, that's, that's, that's just uh, something that needs to be addressed. And by putting this in place, uh, we firmly believe that there's gonna be additional funding sources coming down from the federal government. And I think that uh, having this in place will allow us to streamline that money to where it needs to go. So with that, we, we uh, hope for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colby. Colby. Uh, is Heather uh, Hulsey around? I am. Okay. Welcome to the committee, you have two minutes. Hi, thank you, Chair Barr, Vice Chair and members of the House Environment and Transportation Committee for the opportunity to testify about this. Um, my name is Heather Halsey. I'm the Maryland Market Money Program Coordinator for the Southern Maryland Agricultural Development Commission. Uh, my program is a statewide food access program that matches federal nutrition benefits spent at Maryland's farmers markets. Um, my team supports the creation of a council at the state level to coordinate efforts and eliminate duplication of efforts by regional food councils around the state. Uh, food council support has been invaluable to our work, uh, especially since the arrival of the pandemic. They help us find funding, they advocate for us in terms of public policy, and they make strategic connections where we are otherwise unable. Uh, with food insecurity sharply increasing, we couldn't do what we do without them. And the thought of having a statewide food council to support us and to support our friends at the regional food councils in our efforts seeking state and federal support would be a dream come true. Um, programs like mine are run with a very lean budget and team to manage all the moving parts. We often lack the capacity to be able to take on larger initiatives and projects. We also often become the support system for stakeholders who are smaller scale than us, such as farmers markets, farmers, and food access nonprofits. Um, having a statewide council to support us in return would be so incredibly helpful and effective to enable us to better support food insecure Marylanders, Maryland farmers markets, and Maryland farmers more effectively. Uh, food councils do such important work that runs the gamut from addressing food insecurity and food access 
to the increasingly important role of value chain coordination and ensuring that our food systems are stable, secure, and resilient with local sourcing from Maryland producers being made a priority. So a vote for your support for this bill would be a step toward helping Maryland's food systems and residents to safely come out on the other side of this unprecedented oh. health crisis. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Wilson. Mr. Wilson? Yes, I'm here. Hi, okay. this is Michael J. Wilson. I'm the director of Maryland Hunger Solutions. Thank you, Chairman Barve and vice chair and members of the committee. Um, I think what you've got in front of you is a panel that is very diverse, you know, not only regionally, but in specialties. And I think this reflects the food system as we understand it. You know, the food system is farms and farmers. The food system is grocery stores and retailers. The food system is government agencies like the Department of Human Services, the Department of Health, the Department of, of Education. Um, it includes the charitable sector. Many of you have been involved in this during the course of the pandemic. It also in involves the nonprofit sector and it includes restaurants and many others. And so it would have been really helpful at the beginning of the pandemic if we had a statewide convening council as other states do, so that we could share best, best practices so we can learn from each other from around the state. But we didn't have one but it would be a travesty if we come out of this pandemic and we don't have that in place. You know, there was a reference of our federal dollars coming down in the future. I think if we have this council, we'll be able to more efficiently and more effectively be able to address these issues, not just in food deserts, but also for farmers and for producers and for retailers and for all parts of the state. And so I would ask you on behalf of those who really deal with those who are the most food insecure, the people experiencing poverty in the state of Maryland to move this forward and to report this favorably. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope we will response to any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Next, let's go to Ann Palmer. Ann, are you with us? I am. Okay, um, you're up next. Okay. Honorable Trail Barbe, Vice Chair Stein and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Ann Palmer and I'm an associate scientist at the Bloomberg School of Public Health and a program director at the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, an academic center focused on food systems and public health. In my role at the center, I direct a project called Food Policy Networks, which builds the capacity of food policy councils throughout the United States. The views expressed here are my own. If there was ever a time for food policy councils to prove their value, it has been during the pandemic. Our research found that states and local jurisdictions with active food councils have responded quickly and steadfastly to meet their community's needs. 11 months into the pandemic, they continue to play a key role. In our region, the Montgomery Food Council serves as the lead nonprofit guiding the county's food security efforts, ensuring a coordinated response to the increased food needs that also leverages local food producers. Frederick County Food Council launched an online market with 103 members and nine producers. Baltimore Food Policy Initiative implemented large-scale grocery and meal distribution citywide, online SNAP, and secured state and federal funding for food. At the state level, the Delaware Food and Farm Council coordinated with state and local food providers, <clears throat> cooperative extension, and other agencies to collect and assess data related to food distribution to improve sustainability. In Pennsylvania, the governor's food security partnership advocated for waivers from USDA that were important for inclusive school meals programs and SNAP access. The Maryland Food Res System Resiliency Council could play a similar role in our state, leveraging relationships, expertise, and resources to meet urgent and longer term needs that lead to healthier, more resilient food systems. I applaud, applaud House Bill 831 for proposing the establishment of a Food System Resiliency Council. The pandemic has exposed what we have known all along. Food system issues are best understood by bringing together a variety of stakeholders, all of whom have knowledge and expertise that is needed to solve so many of our problems. Let's not wait until the next pandemic or natural disaster to take action on what we know is an important investment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Netta Squires. Netta. Hello, good afternoon, Chair Barb and members of the committee. My name is Netta Squires. I work for the Montgomery County Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. I helped create and now I help lead the Montgomery County Food Security Task Force. I wanna give you my bottom line up front. So first, we are in a food crisis. Second, 
This crisis has to be addressed by a combined effort between government and food councils and should be led by the state. Hence, the creation of a Maryland Food System Resiliency Council is paramount. And third, emergency management is the right place to house the coordination of this effort because of its unique role in crisis management and its access to resources. There are currently at least 760,000 Marylanders experiencing hunger and hunger causes malnutrition, which in turn has detrimental effects on a person's physical and mental health. Food insecurity in Maryland is a crisis within a crisis and will be felt long after the pandemic is over. Um, dealing with a crisis of this magnitude requires significant data collection, analysis, planning, coordination. To be most effective, there must be close collaboration between government and food councils and among food councils. I cannot think of a better place for the new council to sit than within the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. Having direct access to WebEOC, MEMAC, EMAC, and the experience that emergency management brings to the table will ensure that this new council has the tools it needs for success. From an emergency management perspective, there's no time more vital than now to build frameworks and invest in the infrastructure that will help us alleviate hunger in Maryland in the short and long-term response and recovery efforts. We have an opportunity to create a system that can help bring together the efforts of all food, food councils throughout the state and coordinate a cooperative and resilient network. Personally, I can attest that in Montgomery County, the success of the task force lay in close and ongoing coordination between Montgomery County Food Council and the government with the support of emergency management. Respectfully, I ask for a favorable report on HB 831. Thank you and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And before I recognize uh, Lori Melman, uh, some of you um, don't know my last name is pronounced Barve. That's Barve rhymes with Oive. That's the way I used to explain it in Silver Spring when I was a little kid. Maybe that only works in Silver Spring. Uh, Lori Melman. Uh, we, uh, we are missing her. Oh, I guess we are. Okay, so uh, are there any questions for the sponsor or any of the proponents of this bill? Any questions at all? Okay, you got away with it, uh, Delegate Charcutian, and there's nobody signed up in opposition, and I think nobody else wants to testify. So thank you very much. That ends the public hearing on House Bill 831. I understand the Attorney General has shown up from the Judiciary Committee, if he's here. Uh, we will take House Bill 739. There he is. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, welcome to the committee. Um, you have four minutes, but there will, be mil there will be no doubt millions of questions. So welcome to Environment and Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I do expect that there to be questions. This is an unusual and, and kind of complex matter. What this bill House Bill 739 is designed to do is to bring accountability and uh, fairness to Maryland's law that allocates responsibility for environmental damage when suits against multiple um, polluters are settled. Now, the bill only applies uh, when the state, state of Maryland is the plaintiff and it's bringing a case for industry-wide pollution uh, in its parents patriae uh, capacity. In other words, we're bringing it on behalf of all Marylanders. Uh, specifically, it only applies to state claims for pollution by oil or petroleum products or by a hazardous waste. It does not apply to private party actions at all. Um, it will apply uh, to one of the state's uh, large pending cases, which is a lawsuit for contamination by MTBE, which was a gasoline additive uh, in a case in which there are 62 uh, defendants. Under existing law, when multiple polluters damage resources in Maryland, liability is apportioned among the polluters for settlement purposes, uh, pro rata. That's what the statute says. And that's been interpreted by the courts to mean per capita. They say equal shares that are determined by dividing the common liability by the number of joint tortfeasors. So if you have a suit against 10 polluters for causing oil pollution, a settlement with one party will reduce the responsibility of the remaining parties by 10%. 
And this is true regardless of whether that party caused 90% of the pollution or contributed 90% or 1%. So what HB 739 would do is create a standard that's fairer, uh, more reasonable. The standard set in this bill would hold polluters accountable for the share of damage that they actually caused or contributed to. That's the way it works in our sister states and all, in most of them at any rate. And it's the way it works in federal cases. The allocation formula established by 739 is consistent with the principle that polluter pays. Large polluters will not receive a benefit when smaller polluters settle. And just to give you another uh, hypothetical, take the 10 polluter uh, case. And let's say you have one polluter who caused 80% of that uh, pollution. If the if another polluter settles, that lops 10% off the total. If you have uh, nine settle and not the one who caused or contributed the 80%, it would only be re responsible for 10% of the damage. Um, and uh, the way we do it in HB 739, the liability of a large polluter would be reduced by the amount caused or contributed by each other uh, polluter when they settle, and the large polluter share would remain at 80%. Um, we, we have submitted amendments. We, we got uh, criticism, comment, uh, and let me say first, you know, you know th this legislation does not affect the normal rule in Maryland. We have the Uniform Contribution Among Tort Feasers Act, or UCATA, to, as it's sometimes affectionately referred to, uh, that will continue to apply to tort suits, uh, but not those relating to oil spills or uh, hazardous waste uh, contamination. So we got, we got uh, concern from Ellen Valentino that this bill might somehow put gas stations at greater risk of being held responsible for uh, contributing to MTBE. And we don't believe that it would. Uh, first of all, neither the state nor uh, the large defendants in our case have sued, uh, have sued any of the gas stations and brought them in. And it hasn't happened anywhere else in the country as far as we know. But we've, we've eliminated a provision that gave Ms. Valentino concern, and we've added a, uh, a provision both in section 4421, uh, it's 4421D in the, amended, in the amendments, and 7221F3. And it basically says a responsible person who's resolved, who's settled the case, um, uh, may not seek contribution from any other responsible person who's not settled uh, the person's law, has not settled their case. And um, it, it wouldn't stop anyone from suing the gas stations, but it would uh, prevent somebody who settles from asking a gas station for, for contribution. It thus puts them on the same footing uh, they are in, uh, well, it puts them on a stronger footing than they are under uh, existing law. Um, well, uh, uh, Mr. Attorney General, why don't I cut you off right there? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to Doug Myers, and if Hannibal Kemper has any testimony he wants to offer, then I'll allow that. Then what I'm going to do, ordinarily what I do, and I don't know how much time you have, Mr. Attorney General. Um, I'm yours. You what? I am yours, Mr. Okay. Chairman. So Thank I'm going to do something that's a little unusual. Uh, because this is complex, because it's legal, and because it's an area of public policy we haven't really discussed as a committee, I'm going to go through all the opponents, and then I'm going to entertain questions for you and everyone. Uh, so let me go to Doug Myers on behalf of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. You have two minutes. And then Hannibal Kemmerer, who also will have two minutes. And then I will go through the 10 people who signed up to testify. Well, no, not all 10, but uh, I'll go through all the people who signed up to testify in opposition. And then I will entertain uh, questions for all of you, which is a change to my procedure, but 
I'm willing to do that in this instance. So Mr. Myers. Good afternoon, Chair and Vice Chair. My name is Doug Myers. I'm the Maryland Senior Scientist at Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, you've received written testimony from CBF and from Maryland uh, League of Conservation Voters. I would just like to share some of my own personal experience as I was uh, working for state agencies in Texas where oil spills happen frequently. Uh, it is not uncommon for the, the pipeline, the tank and the pump to be owned and operated by three separate uh, entities. And in such a case of an oil spill, uh, the first thing that each organization does is begin pointing fingers toward each other. And they don't stop doing that until the, uh, uh, the final uh, legal remedy is, is uh, affected. So uh, we are support of this bill um, because we believe that the proportional liability uh, approach will get uh, either, uh, speedier recovery efforts and more fair recovery efforts to damage natural resources uh, that would be uh, affected by a, an oil or hazardous chemical spill. Um, we would like to uh, uh, support um, the, uh, the bill favorably uh, report on HB 739 and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, um, Hannibal Kimmerer. Is uh, Hannibal around? Well, if not, we'll go to the first opponent, and that is uh, Kirk McCauley with the with uh, WMDA. Uh, Kirk. Yes, uh, Chair Bob and uh, Chairman Bob, and uh, members of the Environmental Transportation Committee. Uh, this bill is a very complex bill, as the Attorney General said. Very hard to understand. Uh, they've uh, made some concessions, but they, they don't really address some of the issues. Uh, under this bill, they would go to a fact finder, um, I assume hired by the state, paid by the state to be a fact finder. Um, how impartial he would be, we don't, we don't know that. And it, it would keep all companies from settling and then suing other parties, but it would not keep the state from involving other parties from the beginning because it would uh, let them settle the suits quicker. Uh, this all started with MTBE, um, Exxon, Shell, the, the big companies that they wanted to sue and the dealers, the suppliers had zero to do with MTBE. Uh, they didn't, they had no choice. They, they, they sold what they were given and what was approved. Um, so we just feel that there's so many uh, in this bill, so much in this bill that uh, we don't understand and we don't understand the intent of some of it, that uh, it should be withdrawn truthfully uh, and some ex explanations and, and time studying it. Um, the parts of it uh, are so contradictory with each other that uh, it just needs to be studied. But uh, with that, I've, I've urge an unfavorable report and uh, you have my written uh, and, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Let's next go to uh, Lewis Campion with the Motor Truck Association. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee for the record, Lewis Campion, Maryland Motor Truck Association. We are here in opposition to the legislation. Um, we, we have not had a chance to extensively review the amendments. We've only had them recently. Um, we are asking for our general counsel to review those amendments as well. Um, this is obviously a very complex legal issue. Um, we are concerned about the legislation um, essentially changing the statute by introducing or the standard by introducing this concept of comparative responsibility that doesn't exist in other areas of Maryland law. I know they have considered changes in Maryland law in the past uh, in the you know, judicial proceedings and the judiciary committees and talked about issues of contributory negligence versus comparative fault. Um, and they have preserved the existing standard and, and not moved to that comparative responsibility concept. So um, 
you know, the introduction of this change could be extent, really substantial and extensive. It's impossible for us to tell how broad this is. Again, we are trying to get a better legal analysis, but given the time frame with which we had to submit our written comments before we actually had amendments, um, they reflect the bill as it was introduced. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Next, let's go to John Pika. Mr. Pika. Is John Pika available? Okay, we'll skip over him for the time being and go to Andrew Kirkner. Andrew? All righty, I see Ellen Valentino there, however, so why don't you take your two minutes and then we'll go to the next person and see if we can clean up those other folks. Uh, Ellen, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you and good uh, afternoon, uh, Chairman Barbe and Attorney General Frosch. Um, you know, I want to start by saying I, I represent the Mid-Atlantic Petroleum Distributors and they are owners of service station and they distribute petroleum um, and energy throughout the state. And, you know, I have seen three documents, you know, I have the bill as introduced, the Attorney General's um, uh, comments, and then also um, a red line draft that contains the OAG comments and some contingency attorney comments as it relates to the pending case. You know, and so in fairness, I think I would just want to speak to the testimony presented by the Attorney General. And, you know, he is seeking to create a new standard of liability, a type of proportionate liability standard, you know, in preparation of the current case, but also in preparation of new legacy pollution cases that he's seeking to um, uh, look at or, or potentially bring on behalf of the state. And, and, and I appreciate in an attempt to direct or somehow disturb or aid the contingency attorney in the current pending case, you know, um, uh, and which, does, which does include select retailers operating in the state. Um, so I think that's an important matter. I want to clarify that because I think that highlights our concern about the impact and how this could be applicable um, uh, once put into practice. You know, if the General Assembly wants to Consider and create a new liability standard, you should consider that separately and only apply it to future conduct. You know, don't punish small businesses using a standard that did not exist when they when, when this suit began. You know, we've seen before and with this kind of session and, you know, the stunning time that businesses are going through, issues of liability shift deserve a deep review and analysis. You know, a new law rightly intended, and I appreciate that, but wrongly applied or interpreted could be truly devastating to the small business community. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot here. Um, this sets a tremendous new precedent. We think it's unfair. We do think it's poignant. And um, uh, we hope that you move on favorable or the attorney general reassesses his and withdraws his legislation. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony Gorski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman and committee members and Mr. Attorney General, Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm uh, here, Anthony Gorski, on behalf of the uh, Mid-Atlantic Petroleum Distributors Association following on uh, Ellen's comments that she just had. And I'd like to make a, a couple of different points in regards to the specifics in the statute that caused some of the concerns. And as, as Ms. Valentino indicated, the reference to these new standards, um, <clears throat> contingent, I'm sorry, comparative responsibility and uh, proportional share, not only are those things that have been avoided by the General Assembly in prior years and, and by the Court of Appeals, there's, there's something that this statute doesn't define or articulate a standard for in terms of how the courts are going to apply this. Uh, and so that's a difficult problem with this legislation. Um, there are other portions that are undefined, including the idea of a fact finder. Fact finder typically involves a judgment or a court, whereas in this, you're talking about a fact finder dealing with settle early settlements and in a settlement context, there usually is no fact finder provisions. Um, one of the other items about this is that if you apply these proportionate shares as this is written, even with the amendments to normal cost recovery cases that the state has to bring to get back the special funds that it spends to clean up in individual spills, um, the state is giving up its joint and several liability. It's giving up its ability to collect that 100% of costs that are spent. spent. And the way it happens is that when the settling defendants go out under this bill, um, their proportionate share is deducted from the total owed. And that's not joint and several liability. That This is changing the ability of the state to get back the special funds that are collected 
uh, as from oil companies and everyone else to to apply to these uh, instances. And the state, instead of getting 100% back, is going to get back some smaller portion of that because of this bill. And there are other parts that would apply broader, and that's what we're concerned about. We ask that it be withdrawn. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I understand John Pika has joined us. So let me recognize Mr. Pika. Mr. Pika, John? Yes, sir. There he Mr. is. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, thank you, members of the committee. And, and I apologize for being late. I was just testifying on another bill in the Senate Finance Committee. So, um, you know, this, uh, this is a difficult bill to read through. Um, and I think if you look back and think about your bills on market share that this committee has rejected annually, this is no different than creating market share liability. And, but the difference is those bills that we, that your committee heard in years past would penalize the people who actually committed the wrong. It would have penalized manufacturers. What this bill does is allow a manufacturer or a producer of oil, an oil company to go back and uh, reduce their own liability by seeking contribution from um, a, ga a gas station or from seeking contribution from a distributor. So I represent Royal Farms and they're one of the largest distributors of, of gas in the state of Maryland. They're not the ones who put MTBE uh, in fuel, in gas. And the gas stations are not the ones either. If the Attorney General of Maryland or a department in the state of Maryland wants to sue for an oil spill, they have to, they should follow the same process as any other plaintiff and sue the gas station who has the spill. You take a look at the Jacksonville case back in 2016, that's exactly what happened. If this bill were to pass, instead of suing a gas station, or someone who leaked MTBE onto a pavement, not necessarily into the waters, this bill would allow the oil company that put MTBE in the fuel to go sue a host of other people who had nothing to do with it. They don't have a choice. They can't reject the gasoline. They pick it John, up they bring if it you to could, a gas station. If you could wrap it up, we're going to have a lot of questions. So yeah, I'm going to be able to get to your issue Pretty I, I, I'll conclude right there, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to answer questions and listen to testimony. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. And um, we, uh, is Andrew Kirkner uh, with us? All right, we're gonna go to questions. We're gonna go to questions for uh, everyone who has testified. I'm gonna start off though. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, I have to tell you, I, I you know, I, I have to confess to you a couple of biases that I have. Uh, I do want to hold polluters accountable. As you know, I was a sponsor of the bill that um, that uh, functionally banned offshore oil drilling by um, putting the presumption uh, on the oil company to prove that they weren't negligent, and which is the standard that we had in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I also have a bias of not wanting to, not wanting small and medium-sized companies in the state of Maryland to be unduly burdened by the misdeeds of large international companies. And so uh, given the fact that I, I suspect a lot of the members of my committee have these same kinds of biases. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to just briefly tell me if your proposed bill would do that sort of thing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that question. So this bill does exactly the opposite of what the critics uh, just described. And um, it, it does right now, well, you can take the MTBE case as an example. Uh, right now, the state has sued the major contributors to uh, MTBE pollution around the state. And the state hasn't sued a single gas station. Each one of the oil companies that is a defendant 
has the ability to file a third party complaint against any gas station or any other entity it thinks contributed to uh, the MTBE pollution. Not a single one of them has, has brought an action against an oil company. They have the ability to do it under existing law. And this bill doesn't change that. But uh, what this bill, uh, what I think Ms. Valentino's original concern was, the bill said that a party that settled could bring in somebody else for contribution. We specifically took that out and we replaced it with, with a section that says specifically they can't do that. So what this this is a bill that helps the small well, polluters. Let me, let, let me interrupt you, Mr. Attorney General. Are you saying that under this proposed bill, if you set if you sue successfully sue Exxon, they will be prohibited from suing a Maryland business? Yes, they can sue them. I mean, right now, they can bring in any other business they claim has uh, contributed to MTBE pollution. They haven't done it. Okay. okay. So we're not changing existing law in that respect. Okay, let me ask one more question, then I'm going to start to recognize other people. Uh, who is the finder of fact in this bill? It's the judge or the jury. It's not a bureaucrat? Nope. It's the judge or the jury. That's who the finder of fact is in a lawsuit. Okay. Uh, we have a number of people who have their hands up. Uh, maybe the questions will be put to you. Maybe they'll be put to other people. First question goes to Delegate Sarah Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Nice to see you. Um, my question is for the opponents of the bill. Um, I've read this bill and I've listened to the Attorney General and I've listened to all of you. And, and I'm somewhat baffled by your opposition because I would think that everyone would appreciate proportionate responsibility. If you're a small business and the big guy is 80, 90% responsible, why wouldn't you want to pay only your share and have them pay their share? And, and please don't go off on other sections of the bill. I might, let's stay on my specific question. So if you could answer why you don't want to pay your share of responsibility, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, who'd like to take the first crack at that? Well, all right then. I will, um, Mr. I will, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, if you allow it. Sure, yeah. uh, sure, Mr. Pika, go ahead. Litigation, first of all, I've read the complaint. And the, red, the, the complaint is based on concert of action, enterprise liability, market share liability. That doesn't exist in the state of Maryland. So I don't know what's going to happen. And that's one of the, that's one of the causes, one of the allegations. So I, I'm sorry, are you saying that market share liability is in this bill? No, it's in the complaint. I've read the complaint. The market share liability, concert of action. And, Pika, um, that's not answering my question. So if you could answer okay. my question. Okay. So I want to, so I'm trying to preface the comment with this bill requires in terms of remediation and damages, the wrongdoers to um, remediate pollution in all waters of Maryland until all the MTBE is removed. Now, I don't know how that's done. Mr. That's Pika, a this massive bill doesn't task. mention MTBE. The, the litigation mentions MTBE. Okay, but the, the bill is not the litigation. We're talking about the bill. So on well, the bill and on my question. Well, in all due respect, without the litigation, there'd be no bill like this. This bill is tied to the litigation. So let's just say you want to remove all. So if, if, a, if a gas station is not responsible for the spill, uh, who's going to prove that that particular gas did not get to a water that somehow made it to the Chesapeake Bay? That's all unanswered in this bill, and it's not addressed. So there are there are many problems in this legislation that would so take out gas stations. How about the, how about people who drive the fuel from a um, manufacturer to a gas station? Mr. How Chair. are you going to prove that they're responsible or have a reason to contribute? So maybe they get sued. How much is that going to cost to defend themselves? 
But I tell you, I don't Mr. know Chair, if respect, this. this is actually not answering my question. But in all due respect, I thought I did, but that's okay. Okay, I, I'm going to go to the next person who has. Yep, uh, actually, Mr. Gorski, would you like to take a crack at answering Delegate Love's question? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Delegate sure. Love. Uh, in response to that, I think that uh, no defendant would feel that they should pay more than their fair share, and that's not really the objection. The if you look at the legislation, you, the the only way that this doesn't apply to um, the uh, map to members, distributors, and gas stations in the state is if the amendments that are proposed are actually put into the bill. Um, and then even with those, when you look at the legislation, it is producing a standard that would be applied on other things besides just this, uh, this aspect of cost recovery, or I'm sorry, this aspect of, um, of uh, liability. And so it's, the, without the definitions and without the uh, ability of the courts to determine what it is that the new standard is going to be and how the courts are to apply it, it's it's up in the air as to whether or not a fair share would actually be implemented. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Jay Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, First of all, Mr. Chairman, is, I, I'm looking on the sheet and it doesn't say jointly assigned, but is this bill jointly assigned with judiciary? No, it isn't. It's It's been assigned exclusively to us. How, is, how did we get so lucky? Oh, I worked like a, a devil to make sure we only got this. But I, I think what it is is that the, the speaker wants to keep uh, environmental subject matter, especially with respect to pollution, as intact as possible, which is why the lead paint uh, proportional liability uh, bills uh, come. Well, I guess that was jointly. I, you know what? Who knows? Who knows? There are two things that are mysterious, fiscal notes and bill assignments. Let's just leave yeah, it. I, I agree actually. with you. And, and uh, I appreciate that. But if it's just you know, all my years on this committee, I haven't seen anything quite like this. So, and from a from the you know the judicial side, but um, Mr. Attorney General, I got a couple of questions. I'll try to keep as quick as I can. Um, what laws affect the state's ability to bring large scale industrial wide uh, pollution cleanup actions? Well. Uh, they're in the environment article, and uh, there may be there may be some in the natural resources article, but they're they're in the environment article, and this relates this bill relates to uh, oil spill liability and hazardous waste uh, responsibility, and and if you look at the subtitles that they're in, you'll see what the standards are. The standard of liability is caused or contributed to the pollution. All right. And one uh, uh, additional question, Mr. Chairman, I got this from a farmer sent this. Uh, would a farm with an underground fuel tank, storage tank, be allowed allowed to be sued to mandate removal of the tank and any ground remediation be done because of the bill? No, the bill doesn't change the liability uh, or responsibility for someone who owns an underground storage tank. But if your farmer were sued for MTBE pollution in this, in a case with 62 polluters, they could, they could settle the case for only the amount of their responsibility relative to the responsibility of everybody else. Without this bill, they would be jointly and severally liable for the entire uh, damage caused by MTBE pollution. All right, and and one final question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could uh, Mr. Attorney General, could you give me an example of other lawsuits you consider legacy lawsuits? You, you mean related to pollution? Yes. Um, well, um, there are a there are a number of others that could be brought. Some have been brought by other states, but uh, PFAS is an area. Um, um, I'm blanking on the name of the other uh, chemical that. Um, 
um, it, any any massive uh, oil pollution through a spill or uh, a series of leaks or whatever uh, could be one as well. There, there's another. Um, oh, there's a chemical made by Monsanto, and I'm forgetting the name of it. But there are a number of different states that have sued no, on that. You yeah. know, Mr. Attorney General and Delegate Jacobs, uh, this is not a bill that I'm under any obligation to pass in the next 48 hours. I want to be thorough on this. So, okay, you, right, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, the time you gave me to ask questions. Thank. You. Yeah, and and you know, if you have a second question, I'll uh, I'll entertain that as well, because I realize that this is a complex subject matter for this committee, and I want to make sure that we know what we're doing. Um, Delegate Weivel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this sounds like an awful lot like the uh, market share liability we had on lead-based paint um, uh, for several years in a row. It, is it the same, or is it totally different than, than that? Delegate Weidel, is that a question for me? Yes. Yeah. So it's completely different. Uh, we're not asking you to change uh, change the, um, uh, the, the 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 law for uh, liability. Uh, what we're what we're saying is, when a case settles, um, you should allow a small polluter to exit the case, pay a small amount, and as a result, reduce the remaining liability by an amount equivalent to that contributed by the small polluter. So, so is that small polluter an original party to the original suit or is he sued yes. afterwards? Party by... to the original, party to the original suit. Now, uh, parties can be brought in while the suit is pending. You know, the state here sued 62 companies. Uh, any one of those companies could sue by a third party complaint, additional defendants and bring them into the case. What Ms. Valentino was concerned about uh, originally was the possibility that somebody could, could settle the case and then ask uh, a, a third party to contribute to their liability, uh, can contribute to their settlement. And we've specifically provided in the amendments that that can't happen. The reason that was in the bill originally is because that mirrors the federal law. What, we're, what this bill does is it aligns us with federal law and the law of most of the rest of the states in the United States. They all have different permutations, but this aligns us with the feds and our sister jurisdictions. So what specific problem are we trying to address here? Is the state not getting appropriate funds to do cleanup or spills not being cleaned up? I mean, what, what's not working right now? Why, why, would we have, why would we want to change? Okay, what, what, what works, what, what's going on right now, and an example in the MTVE case is, we have uh, a number of small defendants who would like to be able to get out of the case and we would like to settle with them, but we can't because, because of the per capita rule that is in place in Maryland, we would have to chop 162nd off of uh, the, the case, off of the total liability for every defendant that we settled with. And the companies that are, are the big contributors uh, would have their liability reduced in a disproportionate way. And if you think hey, of the, uh, Mr. Attorney General, let me intercede. Delegate Weivel, you still have the floor. I'm not cutting you off. But let me see if I understand what you're trying to say here. If you have 10 defendants, the current law says the liability has to be equally divided by them. And if one defendant is really only responsible for one-tenth of one percent of, let's say it's a a $1 million, I'm just going to use simple numbers, yeah. uh, but use really simple numbers. Let's say it's a hundred dollars that you expect to get. And um, one defendant is really only responsible for five cents. If you settle with him for five cents, then you could get no more than nine times five from all the other defendants. If we settle with the five cent defendant, yeah. It lops $10 off the case. 
Okay, I think I understand. Uh, Will, go ahead. You still it does it. that under current law. You can settle with the no. defendant now. Yeah, yeah. Or... That, that's that's what happens under current law, and what we would like, uh, and, and this just applies in the settlement phase. What we would like the the law to be is that if we settle with the guy who contributed five cents, it lops five cents off of the total case. So now it's only ninety nine dollars and ninety five cents. And that's current law or what you're proposing with this change? That's what we're proposing with this change. This change, despite what the opponents have said, this change enormously benefits small polluters, people who are responsible, people who are jointly and severally liable for the whole thing if they go to trial, but would like to settle. I mean, if it's $100, you know, and you get a judgment against them all, they're all responsible for $100. If, but, but if they settle, they can walk so, away. So if you have a case now, it's, you know, 10 defendants, each one's responsible for one tenth regardless. Exactly right. In, yes. If we settle with one, it chops off 10%. If we settle with four, it chops off 40%. And, you know, the four may have only contributed together 5%, but it still chops off 40 bucks. All right, I get that. So the last question, and then, then who determines the proportionate uh, share of responsibility? Does the jury determine that? Do you determine that? Who determines the proportionate share of liability? If it's tried before a jury, the jury determines it. If it's tried before a judge, judge determines it. Uh, and you can, so you on, can we'll... make a determination that that five cent guy only responsible for five cent, the jury can determine that and he can be settled and released and the case continues on with the other nine? Yeah, what it, the way it would work in sequence is, we know that the judge or the jury is gonna cut the percentage by a comparative amount, not a, not a per capita amount. So we settle with them, out of the case, gone, no attorney's fees, no nothing, um, out of the case. And when it comes to trial, and we have nine defendants left or six defendants left, the, the fact finder, it's either, a, you know, if anybody elects a jury, it's a jury and otherwise it's a judge. The judge said, well, okay, uh, that person, those settling parties contributed 23% of the uh, uh, pollution. So now we only have 77% left and the folks who go to trial for everyone who's found responsible, they're jointly and, seven, and severally liable for the entire 77%. All right, so you said settlement prior to trial. So the judge determined that 23% liability it, it, for those yes. folks in that example. All right, thank you. Um, before I recognize the next uh, uh, question, uh, Mr. Attorney General, who decides whether it's a judge or a jury? Who, who makes the parties? That decision, what? So, the, the parties, anybody, anybody who is a party, a plaintiff or a defendant can demand a jury trial, in which case there is a jury trial. Okay, uh, Delegate Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think all of our questions are pretty much the same in terms of this comparative responsibility. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Attorney General. I just you got too, off of you. just got off of the Zoom call from Judiciary and you'll be pleased to know, uh, Mr. Attorney General and uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, the Judiciary Committee is still on your bill, which is the bill number one, and they have 12 bills to go through this evening. They have <clears> anyway, my sympathy. we're much more efficient. <laughs> so I'll be here all night listening to them. Anyway, uh, my question is relevant also to comparative responsibility. I think you've answered it. The fact finder, as indicated in the bill, is as you indicated earlier, the judge or the jury. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, all right, great. And then the other part I was going to ask which seems to be everyone else's concern that you've already talked about. Uh, as it says in the fiscal note, if the state obtained less than complete relief from re a responsible person, then the state may continue to pursue an ongoing legal action or bring new legal action against the person. And that's the same scenario as the chairman said, if $100 is owed, you got $10 from one, you cannot go after $90, $90 from the others. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not. I, I didn't 
quite get the context of what the fiscal note was talking about. But yes, that the answer is if we settle with somebody, they're gone. You know, they're, they're out of the case. We don't pursue them anymore. We can't pursue them anymore. And the only issue is how much are the remaining parties in the case responsible for to the state? I, I, I've got it. I think we all had the same kind of question and we're, we're all trying to get the, the same point. I thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Now, let me go back to judiciary. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, uh, Delegate Otto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, thanks for being here. Good to see you, Delegate. Uh, my question, I think we established that, or be sure I understand, this would impact the ongoing litigation? It would. It's not retroactive. Our amendments make clear it's not retroactive, but it, it affects a case that hasn't been settled. Uh, is that an appropriate approach to take it by the legislature to, to? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not retroactive. It's sort of like changing the rules in the middle of the game. Well, uh, it's opinion. not really. Nobody has relied on, uh, you know, when, when, they, when they polluted the bay, when they polluted the groundwater or an aquifer, they weren't relying on the fact that, well, hell, everybody else is going to be jointly and severally liable and pay, uh, you know, and, and I can I can go after them. They weren't relying on it being a per capita uh, kind of a allocation of liability. They were just polluting. And so nobody's legal position or uh, financial position has uh, been determined based upon uh, how liability gets carved up. And so it's it's fair. It's much more fair than the uh, the current situation for especially for the small polluters. Well, I appreciate your explanation, I guess, but uh, uh, you mentioned 62 litigants there that you've uh, yes. filed against. Is uh, two of those the Department of Environment and the Environmental Protection Agency? No, uh, the, the suit is, uh, the, the EPA doesn't have anything to do with it. But uh, the Department of Environment is, we're representing the Department of Environment. We're also representing uh, the people of Maryland in this case. Well, as, as I recall, MTBE was an oxygen ache that the state re and the federal government required to be put in these products. Well, so here, the basis for the case is this. You know, uh, there were a number of different uh, oxygenates and uh, uh, things that, that the manufacturers of gasoline could add that would make it burn cleaner. And EPA and our Department of Environment uh, said, yeah, you've got to do that. We were really following the federal law. We said, you've got to clean up the, the pollution from the tailpipes of cars. They could have added ethanol. They could have added MTBE. Turns out the gas companies, the big oil companies, knew MTBE was cheap for them. It was a byproduct, it was free for them. It was a byproduct of their refining process. So they wanted to use MTBE to clean up the exhaust. And they, they knew at the time that MTBE was water soluble, which gasoline is not. And the, the significance of that is that if, let's say a gas station is, is a great example of this. They have leaking in underground storage tanks, let's say. And you'll see around the, the gas station a plume of you know, gasoline that stays there. Uh, it doesn't run off. But the MTBE in the gasoline does. Whenever it gets hit by water, it moves. And so it finds its way into aquifers. It finds its way into streams and rivers and the bay. Um, and the rest of the gasoline does not. It stays right around the uh, gasoline station. So, um, uh, the I'm, I'm sure these agencies were must have tested these and approved these additives that were put in too. So, but they, they approved them. But they in that case. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, before I recognize uh, the vice chairman for a question, Mr. Attorney General, what would be really helpful to my committee? and I think you have more staff than I do, and my staff is working on a lot of bills. Uh, I would love a summary of what the state of the law is at the federal level and in the 50 states. I would love to know how many other states have this kind of a law 
and how this proposed law compares to what the federal government currently has. Is that possible? Uh, it's cert it's easily done with respect to the federal government. Doing it for each state is quite a chore, but I can tell you. Well, why don't you pick the big states first, like Texas, California, New York? Okay. Like that. Uh, and in, in terms of our neighbors. Uh, uh, and our New neighbors. Jersey, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and D.C. all have this kind of uh, uh, proportionate liability rule. Okay. Uh, the vice chair has a question. We'll get you details. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Attorney General, for your presentation. I've got a couple questions. Um, first is, I understand your point that your bill, in a sense, would be fairer to small companies because they just have a tiny share of responsibility. They could, that's all they would be responsible for, and they, they could be out of the litigation. But on the other hand, would 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 the state be inclined to bring in, if this bill passes, bring in more small companies into the litigation? Because now um, if you settle with them, you don't have to worry about a pro rata share of liability um, against the big guys um, going away. I, it doesn't create an incentive to bring in small contributors. It's, it's a lot of trouble. Uh, I mean, each defendant is uh, a separate case on its own. What did they do? How did they do it? How much oil was spilled, et cetera. So it's a lot of work. It's not worth it to bring in a small contributor like a gasoline station. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it doesn't create an incentive uh, to, to widen or deepen the pool. It, it just makes the existing pool more manageable. Okay. My second question is, um, the opponents seem to be arguing that um, the comparative responsibility rule, which the bill would implement in these types of cases, would somehow undermine the contributory negligence rule, which applies in other tort cases. So could you address that? Yeah, uh, this bill has nothing to do with that. This isn't comparative versus contributory negligence. It doesn't address that uh, principle at all. Yeah, this it, is, it seemed like I, I've, hold on. go ahead, I'm sorry. It, it, this bill, um, this bill addresses the allocation of responsibility once liability has been determined. So, you know, and, and in fact, in these cases, um, we're, we're looking at strict liability. When you're talking about oil spills, when you're talking about hazardous waste, you let hazardous waste, uh, you know, go down your drain or pour it out in your backyard or something like that. It doesn't matter whether you were negligent or not. It's you're liable for it. So um, the, the idea of contributory versus comparative negligence is totally irrelevant. The, this bill addresses only cases brought by the state and it only uh, and it, it relates to the allocation of uh, the total responsibility at the back end but not for liability purposes. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General for uh, being here today to help us uh, tr try to understand this. Uh, earlier in your converse, uh, in your remarks, you spoke of PFOS. Is that the yeah, PFI, yeah. Is that the chemical that they use to re uh, as a fire retardant? Yes. That can get into the groundwater. Yes. Uh, and uh, now if, if we had a case where PFOS was showing up in the groundwater, and it was on a, a military installation or a state-owned airport or something like that. Uh, who would be the major contributor to something like that? The the installation that used it, or the person that made it and supplied it. So uh, the maker and supplier is the principal. Uh, person who's responsible. 
it could also be the entity that purchased it. I mean, it could be the United States Army. They may not be liable to states for PFAS uh, pollution, but, but hypothet let's say hypothetically they are. So it could be the Army that innocently you know, takes this stuff, puts out some fires and causes uh, PFAS uh, uh, pollution. And you would say, well, hell, they're not as responsible as the manufacturer. They're both, they're both responsible. But you would say, well, the army didn't know that it, it, it was a problem. The manufacturer did. And you might argue the manufacturer should be large, it should be responsible for a larger share. And that's what this bill uh, would allow. Okay, uh, that's very interesting. I have reasons to ask you that question. But so um, maybe one time when I see you, I'll explain what it is. And the other question, is there any other lawsuits that are out there now that this bill would affect? I, there are. Um, I, I don't know all of the lawsuits that um, have been brought on behalf of the Department of Environment. Uh, they're not, it's not nearly as significant to any other suit that I'm aware of. Uh, may not be even applicable to any other suit that I'm aware of, but uh, the Department of Environment, we on behalf of the Department of Environment, bring lawsuits for hazardous waste and oil uh, pollution when they arise. And usually if there are parties, and there are, you know, if you got a toxic waste dump or something like that, um, there are usually two, three, four uh, um, responsible parties. Sometimes for a toxic waste dump, there may be more, um, but, but the cases that I, uh, I can't say I couldn't name one right now, but the, the cases that I've seen only have uh, a few responsible parties and not 62. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your, uh, your comments. Thanks for the question. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Sure, um, before I recognize Delegate Healy, um, you know, in our committee, we are constantly confronted with substances that some people think are dangerous, but which there's no scientific uh, consensus over the danger. Um, glyphosate is a good example. Um, the EPA hasn't ruled against it. And while a couple of jury, jury verdicts have been brought against glyphosate, from my reading of the science, it's very, very iffy as to whether or not there are human carcinogenic effects. Now, I could be completely wrong. It could be that in the year 2021, based on the science of today, that's true. But in the year 2023, um, scientific consensus changes. So what is to become of a person who uses the best science that they're aware of in the year 2021 but then discovers in the year 2025, based on the advice of federal regulators uh, that they relied upon in the year 2021, in the year 2025, they start to discover that they're being sued for what they thought was a good faith decision. I mean, what then becomes of all those businesses and farmers and all those people? Well. Uh, let me start, Mr. Chairman, by saying this bill wouldn't affect that in any way. Um, it, there, right now in Maryland and in virtually every other state and the federal uh, law, uh, people are uh, strictly liable for pollution caused by hazardous substances, and including including petroleum products. So, I mean. I, I just, I couldn't predict, I couldn't say with respect to any, you know, one chemical versus another, but, um, you know, we do have, we do have legacy uh, chemicals, some of which are very hazardous and some of which are not. And um, if, if science in the future determines that they are uh, hazardous, then, uh, you know, people who uh, have caused uh, pollution by them are likely to be responsible. But I, you know, beyond that, I can't, I can't. In, I mean, for example, Mr. Attorney General, 
you have to be living under a rock today to not know that lead is harmful. But there was a time when the city government of Baltimore encouraged uh, landlords to use lead paint. And if you were a landlord and you used lead paint back then, uh, you were making a good faith effort to be a good landlord. But today, if you did it, obviously you're, you know, being highly irresponsible. And I, I guess my only con a concern of mine is that, you know, if a jury, you know, is swayed by a persuasive attorney to rule something is not being safe when the scientists feel otherwise. I, I'm just, I'm very concerned about, un, un, I, look, I, I get it with respect to the oil and gas industry because I don't trust them. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant with respect to other chemicals and substances, many of which, you know, everything is safe until it's discovered not to be. And I hate to hold li libel people who were good faith users when the scientists were saying it's okay. Well, I, I can agree with that sentiment. This bill wouldn't change the law with respect to them, except that if they were a small contributor, they would have less liability or less exposure is a better word under this uh, bill if and when somebody went after them. Okay, Delegate Healy's next. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, um, I am not an attorney, and so I, I, this is a question, it may sound ridiculous, but I'm trying, jointly and severable, all of that, um, was explained to me one time as like that you kind of sue everybody, and then, you know, the, the people with the deepest pockets end up paying because they have the money. And the people who don't have much money end up don't ha not having to pay because they don't have as much. And, and that's how it was explained to me. Is that anywhere close to accurate? Yes, it's close to accurate. So here's, uh, and thanks for the question, Delegate Healy. So, so um, if you have 62 people responsible for pollution and you sue them all, they're all jointly and severally liable. If if you, you could pick any one of them and say, okay, you know, we got a judgment for a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars. And you could say to, to any one of the, let's say, there, let's say there are 50 parties just for round numbers that are, that are held liable, um, found to be responsible. Um, you could say to number one, okay, pay me the hundred million dollars, you. And that person, then says, well, I, I don't have the whole hundred million. They can turn to any of the 49 other parties and say, all right, you have to contribute to this. So the state only has to go after, you know, it, it, it could only go after one party for collection. And that party then tries to figure out how I'm going to get the money from the other 49 parties, or the state could go to all 49 parties. But, but the point is, each one of those 40, 50 parties is completely responsible for the entire $100 million judgment until it's paid off. So, I, okay, let me, so I'm gonna name companies that really haven't done anything bad. I'm not trying to get sued for naming companies, but say company X that's, that we all know is like this gazillion dollar company that has more money than the, the national debt. And they're one party. And then you have, you know, your local gas station. <laughs> Obviously that there's a lot of disproportion there. I, uh, would the state like lose out if um, you can't go after the people with the deepest pockets to, to pay off? Yes. So, uh, yes. And so there are two stages where we talk about um, allocation of responsibility. One is its settlement and one is after a judgment. So, you know, what this bill does is it's a, it doesn't change joint and several liability. Anybody who goes to trial and is found responsible is jointly and severally liable for the entire uh, amount of the judgment. 
But if they settle, and, and this is why it's especially advantageous for smaller uh, contributors, if they, they settle and they don't have to be responsible for a per capita share of that entire liability. So let's say there are 10 parties and a hundred million dollar liability. Um, they're not each, uh, you, you don't lock $10 million off every time you settle with a party. So the state can then say, okay, you only contributed $1 million of, of damage. We'll settle with you for 500,000 and you can, you can walk away. The, the judge at the end of the case will say, okay, well, that's, they, they were responsible for a million dollars worth of the damages. We're going to subtract a million dollars from the hundred million. And now we've got nine other defendants. We're going to divide up 99 million um, for them based on how much they contributed. Otherwise, you know, they'd each be jointly and severally liable for the whole amount. Okay. Yeah. It, this is really complicated. Thank you very much. It is. Chairman Barve, I think you're muted. I am, usually it's other people. Um, gang, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm not in a big rush on this. Uh, Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. The, the, the more I'm thinking or trying to get my mind around this, the more difficulty I'm having. Um, but to go back to um, Delegate Haley's question and point about joint and severable, several, severable liability, it's, it's the only form of fault with the uh, with respect to polluters that I'm somewhat familiar with from having written you know a long long time ago about federal Superfund law. So I, I'm trying to understand what system we would be moving from because you keep talking about joint and severable severable liability. Uh, where we're moving from from just doing some quick research, it looks like we right now use a system of contributory negligence. Is that, why is that not working, first of all, if you don't think it's working? And is that synonymous with, or is there an overlap with joint and severable, severable liability and contributory negligence? Are those two totally different standards? Uh, it, okay, it's a, it's a good question. And, and this is, I, I suppose, one of the most difficult pieces of, of this uh, proposal. So contributory, there, there are two different regimes uh, for determining liability. And um, uh, Maryland is one of, I think, four jurisdictions that adheres to the contributory negligence um, liability doctrine as opposed to the comparative uh, liability doctrine. This case uh, does not address uh, that issue at all. Uh, comparative is, is a word that we, we use, it's proportionate is a better way of thinking of it, but we use the, 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 the word comparative when we're talking about uh, in this bill, allocating uh, the responsibility for a, a judgment. Um, but okay, so con contributory and uh, comparative relate to a determination of negligence. And um, in Maryland, if, you, if you're accused of uh, hitting somebody with your car, you can argue that I'm not responsible at all because that person was eight inches out into the crosswalk when I hit her, okay? That absolves you of all responsibility. Um, under a comparative negligence doctrine, uh, what the court would say was, well, um, you were you were ninety percent at fault. The the person was just leaning out of the curve. You curb. You came whipping around and and hit her. Um, so we're going to take off uh, ten percent uh, of the judgment against you because she was ten percent uh, responsible, or it could be forty five percent. Okay, but that's that's not at issue here. What's at issue here is um, how we're going to chop up the, uh, the damages and whether we're going to do it based on uh, the number of people that are being sued 
or based on the amount of pollution that they contributed. And so we, the state has to prove that they're responsible. And for, um, for the, the, the count that we've brought under the environment article, it, there's a strict liability uh, standard. So they're liable if MTBE is in the groundwater. Okay, and, and, they, and they put it there. Um, they're, so now you get to how much do they have to pay uh, once we've determined that they're liable. And what this bill does is it, again, now you still have two stages left here um, after you get past liability. Question is one, one party wants to settle and I don't wanna go through, this case has been going on for a couple of years already. We're still at very preliminary stages. Um, one party says, look, I, I didn't, I'm not, I, I, I caused a little bit of pollution. I wanna get out of this. I don't wanna pay an attorney for another three or four years or one year. Um, I, wanna, I wanna be done with it and walk away. And so we've written the bill so that that person walks away and has no other responsibility once we settle with them. And it enables us to settle with them uh, and not uh, take a big whack out of the responsibility of uh, say a major polluter who's still left in the, uh, in the group. And on a per capita basis, uh, you know, that's what happens on a proportionate basis, um, you know, it, if they're responsible for 2%, we lop off 2%, not 10% with 10 parties. And so Mr. Chair, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Sure. Uh, okay, so with respect specifically to page four of the bill, lines 21 through 26, that says if one party settles, that it can turn around and go after another responsible party that has not yet settled. Is, is the reason for that to try to create an incentive for everyone to settle or and if not, doesn't that get at the concern you heard from some of the opponents about parties then being more vulnerable? Um, I, I was just, I was a little confused by so, provision. Uh I'm, are you looking at the, the bill as amended or are you looking at the original bill? Oh, you're, you're muted, Delegate. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. That might be the original, but that. Okay, uh, can, could you read me the language? Because it, um, it's, it's, I can tell you the lines that I was looking at, um, which are, it's page four, lines 21 through 26, and it talks about you know, if, if uh, one party that has settled, one of the responsible parties, one of the ones deemed responsible had, have settled, they can turn around and go after other designated responsible parties that have not yet settled. Um, so I'm looking at the amended version. And if you, it, so we've added, um, we've added language that says that a responsible person who has resolved the person's liability to the state in a settlement or through the satisfaction of a judgment may not seek contribution from any other responsible person who has not settled the other person's liability to the state in accordance with this section. Okay, so uh, that has changed. I, I, I think so. Because I read it the opposite, unless I was... That's, that's the operative provision. Now I'm looking for, um, let me see. Maybe I get that one word may not and it or, yeah. uh, yes so we inserted we that's okay. right so we inserted okay. not in there okay uh, maybe. That's, thank you yes thank you thank you mr chairman okay so um i'm going to recognize delegate boyce delegate wyville delegate terraza and then the last question is going to go to delegate amprey then we'll go to the last bill and uh, that that will conclude the public hearing and um, then we'll go to the last bill. So, Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Attorney General. You have been uh, so gracious with your patience and us understanding us. And I'm just gonna spit this like I think I understand it, okay? So, general cases, you tend to be held up because everyone's trying to determine 
because the liability is all the same, you have your defendants, I guess, per se, um, arguing about their percentage of the liability because it's all the same. What we're doing is changing this so that, because everyone is also being held up at the same time because they're all in the same lawsuit. So this bill change allows one, for me, because regardless I'm, I'm uh, liable to pay what I am liable for and get out of that lawsuit. And then the nine people can then fight it out until everyone kind of pairs down, pays their liability, and then everybody is out versus fighting over years after years after years because none of us agree, of course, that we have an equal, um, uh, um, an equal liability. So this essentially says you're all liable, but you're liable for this 5%, you're 30, you're 50, you're 80. If I agree to that, I pay, I get out, and I cannot then be sued because I did know that we did have that amendment by the person who had the most liability can't then come after me because I've already settled and I'm out of this case. That's exactly right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Just say that. Okay, Delegate Weivel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a second round. I just want to clarify, there was testimony of the comparative negligence versus contributory negligence, but I heard you say this bill does not. It does impose. not affect that. It does okay. not affect market share liability. It does not affect, um, uh, let, let me say, with respect to market share liability, there are, there are uh, federal cases that may control this that uh, permit the court to do market share liability. I think that's not likely to be necessary here, but, but there is an argument that it applies in this case, unlike the, the regular law in Maryland. But this bill does not change the law with respect to market liability. It does not change the law with respect to contributory versus comparative negligence, period. All right, thank you. And then one last question. So I, you know, I've listened to all this pretty closely, but the one question I have is um, if, you, if the state had this new standard, would they be inclined to bring more defendants into the original case with the hopes of either getting more money or getting money from more parties so people would be more apt to settle rather than pay attorney's fees? I, I don't think it increases the state's incentive. I mean, first of all, we're the state. You know, we're, we're going to do what we think is in the public interest. So, you know, we're not, we're not making decisions based on, you know, any crass calculation, like can we squeeze this small business uh, harder in order to get a few more extra bucks. I, that's not the way. That's not the way state operates or should operate. Um, but that aside, I don't think it creates an incentive for the state to uh, go after more small defendants. Um, you know, it's it's the big guys that that uh, have the most responsibility, have the deepest pockets. And those are the ones uh, that it makes the most sense in, to focus on. And they're the ones that it's fairest to, to focus on. But when somebody contributes a significant amount, it's hard to leave them out. And if the state elects not to sue them, there, there's a substantial risk that one of the other defendants, most likely one of the big guys, will file a third party complaint against them to drag him into the lawsuit. So you, there's a balancing act. You know, you you want to get the people who you know have contributed something significant, um, and if you leave them out, then there's a risk that you know somebody else will bring them in. But chasing a small defendant just isn't worth the effort. All right, thank you, Delegate Terraza, and then the last question will go to Delegate Amprey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and um, thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for this bill and for being here. Um, I just want to see if I can, if I have this straight and maybe help clarify it. I'm not sure, but with respect to strict liability and negligence, that's sort of the standard by which um, 
the court would decide whether the defendant or defendants were actually liable for for the it, for whatever issue they're being sued, right? That's just about whether or not they did it, whether they with whether whatever group of defendants should be held responsible. And in the case of contributory negligence or comparative negligence, whether something the plaintiff did bars recovery or bars them from being held responsible. But what you're talking about is this per capita versus proportional, which has nothing to do with whether defendants should be held liable, but just how to split up that liability once 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 that liability is determined or in the case of settlement before that liability is determined. Is that correct? Yes, Delegate Tarasa, that's exactly right. Okay, then I think I understand, thank you. Delegate Amprey. Thank you, thank you Chairman, and thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Attorney General, for, for, for being here with us this long today, and I feel like I'm back in my torch or civ pro class today. <laughs> You have my deep sympathy. <laughs> and I'm reminded why I chose transactional law. Um, so um, my question just kind of goes back to uh, what my colleague was mentioning earlier, Adele Gatto. I, I understand it's not. I understand that it's not retroactively being fitted, but I still feel as though the nature of when this law would take place still somewhat has an effect on. Uh, the strategy of, of litigators, right? And in the sense of, you know, I sometimes you decide to go through with the with the case, and sometimes you decide to settle early because of the current climate, right? So if things are going to change now to where how things are settled out changes in the midst of post your decision whether or not to settle or to go through with the entire litigation, that still kind of feels to me as though it's it's kind of, it, it could come across as unfair for those who started the process and now are going to have to deal with a different type of, uh, of settlement or uh, apportionment process than they expected. So I understand that it's not truly a retroactive law because this is, this is post the determinants, but still your determination to go through with a lawsuit is a strategy in which you, you, you're thinking about the, the end. And now the end has been altered with this, the end is altered with this law. So I'm just trying to understand, can you give some more detail as to why this isn't as funny and fishy sounding as I currently perceive as far as okay. it's retro retroactively yeah. kind of, it kind of feels retroactive. Yeah, so it, it's not. In the, amend, in the amended version, we say specifically, it only applies to cases that haven't settled, but that does mean it applies to the MTBE case. And yeah, I, I would agree with you that it might change the strategy of, um, of a lawyer for one of the defendants in, in some circumstances. But um, I, I think it's very beneficial to small defendants and it, you know, to, to, to small contributors, I should say. And it conceivably is to the disadvantage of the large contributors because their share might not be artificially uh, uh, hacked away at uh, if we were to settle with small defendants. Um, in fact, it, it's probably worse for everybody um, because we can't really settle with a small defendant. Uh, the, state has, the state has many disincentives for settling with a, a small defendant uh, under existing law because um, you know, it, it lops too much off the liability of the big guys. So that would mean going to trial with 62 uh, defendants. Terrible for uh, everybody except the lawyers uh, for the defendants who make a lot of money. No, no uh, yeah, thank you. And I, I think it's just a matter of, you know, having more offline conversations and, and just trying to get a few uh, if, I'd be happy to talk individually to any of the members who has a question. Okay. It's just occurred to me, thank you, Delegate Amprey and committee. It just occurred to me that almost, not almost, all the questions were put to the Attorney General and two of the opponents, maybe three, have hung in there and listened to all this. So I'm going to allow any of the opponents who want to have a final word to have one because I don't want for there to be an appearance that I've been unfair to the opponents of the bill. Do I, any of you want to say anything before we sign off on this topic? I, 
I would like to say something. And first of all, sure. I appreciate it. And sure. it's kind of very helpful because we get to hear from the attorney general and gives us an opportunity and him an opportunity to clarify some things that um, need clarification. Just in short, um, uh, there are retailers included in this case. And just as it might benefit the small the small people that are in the case, it also benefits the large. It creates an incentive for some of the larger companies to settle. And it doesn't preclude those larger companies from bringing us into this current MTBE case. But as you deliberate, I hope you consider the impact of this, not just on the current case pending. And you're right, he can settle at any time. Nothing needs to change. But on the other definitions of hazardous substances and what I think lies ahead for a business in this, this is a shift. This is a liability change. And it is. It is very much um, something that delivers deliberation. It's not in a vacuum of contributory negligence compared to fault, and it's not in a vacuum of shared market share. And so I appreciate it, and I look forward to additional conversations as well. Thank you. Uh, Lewis, uh, Mr. Gorski, do you have any, uh, Mr. Pika, if you're still here, or Colby, uh, do you have anything you'd like to say before I go on to the last bill of the afternoon? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have anything more to add. Yeah, no, okay. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John? Colby? Okay, so um, thank you, uh, Attorney General. Thank you to the committee. Highly complex issue area. I know we're all going to be talking about it amongst ourselves. Uh, I don't want, you know, we have 55 days here if we choose to do anything this year. Uh, so I don't want to rush anything as big and complex as this. Thank you all. And with that, we will conclude the public hearing on House Bill 739 and go to the last bill of the afternoon, House Bill 860, Delegate Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Gilchrist, House Bill 860 is concerns agricultural land preservation in the state. Um, House Bill 860, it extends and slightly modifies a goal that the legislature set back in 02 of preserving about a million acres of agricultural land in the state. In 02, this was done in a resolution and it expires in 2022. Now we're about 80% of the way there. Uh, that resolution identified um, four programs it did not include Maryland Environmental Trust, which this uh, bill adds in. And if you include Maryland Environmental Trust, we are about 80% of the way there. It's about 800,000 acres uh, towards about a million uh, acre goal. Um, in the last five years, we have um, preserved 70,000 acres. So at our current rate, it's gonna take us about more than 10 years to get there. Uh, this this adds eight years. And in 02, when this was done, there was a large task force. And Mr. Chairman, when, when I thought about it in the fall, I thought, well, maybe this isn't the best time for a task force. But I didn't realize that Zoom actually, actually made meetings much easier. Um, but still, it may not, I don't know that it is time for a task force. I think these programs are working well. We'll have a full public hearing on it today for any complaints or uh, questions about the, the current program. Um, let me highlight Department of Planning's uh, information letter. They include a link to what, what they've set up as a uh, Maryland Protected Lands uh, dashboard. And that you'll see there, there's you know, 1.7 million acres in, in the state preserved. That includes federal lands, state parks. That, inc that includes everything. Um, but, but a very interesting dashboard to show where the whole state is. Um, we have about 6 million acres of land in the state. Let, um, the fiscal note says that the fiscal effect is unclear. It may be that we want to have some uncodified language to say that this is a goal. This does not require funding. It, it's simply an extension of the goal that's already there. The American Clean Power letter, they ask if it requires another million acres. And I think uh, very clearly doesn't, but uncodified language perhaps could make that clear as well. Mr. Chairman, that, that is the bill, it's House Bill 860. It, 
extends the goal to uh, preserve a million acres of agricultural land in the state. Um, I know there's at least one person signed up to testify, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me just say that uh, having as an instinct a hesitancy to uh, introduce a task force is always a good instinct to have. But uh, yes, Colby Ferguson has signed up favorable with amendments. No one else has signed up to testify and then we'll go to questions. Colby. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of uh, Maryland Farm Bureau. And uh, we, we support this bill. Uh, uh, Delegate Gilchrist reached out to us uh, in the interim to discuss um, whether this needed to be extended or not. Uh, I think um, we, we uh, reiterated that we definitely would like to see this continue um, to con continue to move forward because by having this goal in place and, and, you, and you have the discussion one of these days on program open space and how that funding is done, uh, we want to make sure that the agricultural land preservation programs stay in place and um, continue to move forward because one thing we don't have any more of and you can't make any more of is land. When it's gone, it's gone. When it's covered up, it's covered up, whether it be houses or schools or whatever the use might be. Um, one, the reason why we have an amendment in there, um, the bill does get a little prescriptive of which uh, programs would fall under this goal. And if we're going to do that prescription, um, we should probably go ahead and make sure we have all the, um, the ones in there that, that do preserve agricultural land. And the one that's not is uh, Marbidco, which is the Maryland and Agriculture and Resource-Based Industry Development Corporation. Uh, they have a program called the Small Farm Next Generation Ag Land Acquisition Program. Um, we call it basically Next Gen. Um, they have a small farm component, which can't be sold to like mouth or or rural legacy because it's under 50 acres. So they are actually purchasing uh, easements on those smaller farm operations. So we would just ask to have that included with that prescription of the different um, components, but I think it's a great bill. Uh, it, would, it would actually, the goal would actually expire in 2022. So we think this is a timely um, bill and should, should move forward. Thank you. Okay, uh, the first question goes to Delegate Healy. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in this because, but I want to understand a couple things. Is, is this fun mostly about the preservation aspect or agricultural land? Because we now have, in the last few years, thanks to the work that's been done largely in Baltimore City, a new wave of urban agriculture. And um, <clears throat> use it like reclaiming urban land for agricultural purposes. And so the question to me is, is this only about the preservation programs or is this about agriculture as a business and, is, and growing it so that it's like in urban areas as well as new farms that are being created? Well, thank you for bringing, bringing that up. You know, this committee, we've already passed an urban agricultural bill out of committee, and there is nothing preventing urban agriculture from being part of these programs to, to be preserved um, right now. And when you look at the programs that, that, are, that are involved, you have MALP, Rural Legacy, Greenprint, you have local TDRs and PDRs, and we're adding in Maryland Environmental Trust. And you know, the purpose of the bill is for agricultural land preservation. These programs, acres count, strictly speaking, they might not all be agriculture, but um, mostly um, they are, overwhelmingly they are. And I know Colby, Colby uh, do you wanna respond as well about urban ag? Yeah, I think the best thing to, to probably the simplest way to understand what this bill is doing, um, it's the purchasing of the development rights. Um, so if, a, if it's an agricultural land, which is basically hasn't been, had anything, it still has its ability to build a house or multiple houses. And what these programs do is they purchase those development rights. So the land stays in that use for perpetuity. Um, it doesn't doesn't it doesn't change on what you can do as long as it stays agriculture, but um, it you know, there's some freedoms within the agricultural programs, whether it be agritourism or things like that. But on the urban side, um, 
under the vast majority of these programs, they are limited at 50, 50 acres in size. So which would make it more difficult in the urban areas, but that's why the small farm next gen program was created for those suburb, I call them more suburban areas that are farming right at Metro's edge that are maybe 10 acres, 15 acres that could potentially have a house built or be annexed into a town or a municipality um, can be actually preserved to stay in agriculture. Certainly if there was a task force, this, that would be an issue as well. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next question goes to Delegate Otto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Gilchrist explained to me, read the fiscal note, it looks like we're just extending the time frame to meet that goal. Uh, yeah, that's that's the basic gist of that. That was established in 2002? Yes. Also, I'll remind you the funding, much of that comes from, most of it comes from the ag transfer tax. Uh, and you know the economy that we had in 2007 and on, and uh, much of the money was taken out of and shifted to bonds. So instead of paying for it with cash, we ended up paying for it with uh, uh, for 30 years. With uh, and matter of fact, we're doing that this year, taking 30 million dollars out of ag land preservation and backfilling it with uh, with bonds. So, um, Delgado, I, I will know important note part. The, the change that this bill makes that's different from what we did in 02 is we're including Maryland Environmental Trust. And MET, they actually take donations of land and donations of easements. Um, and certainly these programs all have a fiscal history, you know, program open space when we need money is, is moved around. And all these, I mean, each one of these programs you could do a history of. And this of course is a goal and it doesn't require funding. It doesn't require anything, it, but it does continue the goal we've had uh, that to preserve agricultural land. Thank you. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a real quick question for the uh, spot, uh, Delegate. Uh, does that number, that goal, does that include uh, land that's preserved by individual counties? What's included are um, local, yeah, local, um, local programs are included and usually those are PDRs or TDRs. Transferable, TDR. de transferable okay. development rights or purchases of development rights. Okay, thank you. That I just wanted to make sure they were included in that. Thank you. Next question goes to Delegate Holmes, then Delegate Harrison. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm asking this question only because of a, of a news report that I heard on NPR yesterday, or day before yesterday. Um, can you have solar panels within these, uh, these, these areas that, that you're preserving here? So, solar farms, are they allowed in this, this preserved area? I bet they aren't. They, they are very, um, the limitation within the Maryland Ag Land Preservation Foundation, which is mouth, is 5% of the property or five acres, whichever one is smaller. So you could do a five acre operation. It's primarily focused on um, being a net metered project versus an actual commercial, commercial or, or selling back to the grid. So under farm preservation programs, they do not allow the, the commercial operations to be installed. But, but you can't, could you have it for your own personal use then? Yes, long as it's under, long as it's 5%. Uh, five, five percent or five acres, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. Yeah, Delgado, you know, I believe uh, our, our chair had a bill in a number of years ago about that very issue. Right, yeah. and, um, and it's just not possible to do for legal or tax purposes to even if we were to change the law to allow solar on land that's in an ag easement, the negative tax consequences to the property owner would be such that uh, they wouldn't want to do it or we wouldn't want them to do it. I will say before I get to Delegate Harrison, the irony in all of this is something Colby said is actually slightly not correct. The only one of the few applications 
that you can put on rural land that can allow a res restoration of farming is terrestrial solar. And it's the only form of electric power generation where they have to be able to remove it. Uh, you know, after 40, 50 years, you could restore that land to farmland if you wanted to. I mean, it's the only form of electric power generation for which that's true, ironically enough. Delegate Harrison. Thank you. Um, there was something said just uh, about the transfer of development rights and um, um, the PDRs as well. A few years ago, in the when I was in a different position, we had a big discussion and about this and bills. And I think one of the main issues is that individuals wanted to um, have the right to do with their property that they wanted. So as we talk about, you know, land that may be in suburban areas or along um, those edges, um, quite frankly, for someone um, who, you know, has, I don't, I don't know the size, but they had some land that may fall under this category or, or as far as acreage is concerned. Um, and, and it's more profitable for them if they wanted to sell to, you know, someone who wants to do some other development, as long as it's approved in that particular locale, this would then prevent them from doing so. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, if you have, if, if you sold your easements, your development, which could be a house, could be, you know, tran transferring it to a commercial use, um, a retail use, whatever, whatever the other intended land uses could be. If you sold that easement and, and, and the state paid you for that development right, which could be 50% of the value of the property, whatever whatever the, the surveyor determines the value of that easement is, um, that's in perpetuity. You made that decision as the landowner. Uh, if you sell that property, if I, if I did that and I sold the property to you, that, that conveys with the property. So if you bought that property and um, and then decided, hey, I think I want to build another house, or I want to, I want to annex it into the to the neighboring town. That would not be allowed. It's a permanent deal. So that, the the MET, which is Maryland Environmental Trust, so you'll you'll hear about like what they call green belts. So there'll be municipalities that decide, you know what, we don't want to we don't want to grow anymore. We like the size of our town. They'll purchase the MET will come in and purchase the land, the, the agricultural land around it to prevent future expansions of a small town. Uh, they, they call them green belts. And, and, and some do it in the, in the central part of the state because it's, um, they're on Pied Piedmont soils, which means that their water, they don't have a lake underneath there. And so they need the water recharge area. So um, their wells don't go dry. So a lot of those are what we call green belts to keep okay. open space. All right, thank you. Okay, that appears to be, <clears throat> pardon me, that appears to be the last question on this bill, which ends the public hearing on House Bill 860. It also ends the public hearing for the day. I wanna thank the committee for all the really thoughtful questions with respect to the um, Attorney General's bill. And I definitely expect to hear from all of you offline. Um, so uh, announcements, uh, what subcommittee chairs have announcements? Um, Delegate Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Housing and Real Property Subcommittee was going to have our second meeting today at 5 p.m., but that meeting has been canceled because, uh, number one, I'm still on a Zoom meeting with Judiciary, <laughs> where, where we are secondary on a couple of bills, and uh, I'm not quite sure when we're going to have that hearing on the bills that we are secondary on yet. Okay, any other subcommittee chairs? Uh, well, I have to have my leadership David. with my leaders. Uh, Marvin, how long are you going to be on this, do you think? Well, right now we are on uh, one, two, three. We are on the fourth bill. Um, oh, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're on the no, fourth. Go ahead. Go ahead, Marvin. We're, we're on the fourth bill right now. And the two bills that we are jointly assigned are five, six, seven, eight. Ninth and 10th. Okay, well, look, I'd like to have our leadership meeting at five o'clock. And, uh, and who, who, who are the other members of the committee that are assigned to join you there? 
Wells and um, I'm sorry, um, Weibel, Weibel, and um, Teresa, Teresa, Teresa. Weibel okay, Teresa. well, well. Yeah, so Marvin, you're going to have to play hooky at five o'clock for a, a leadership meeting. I'm going to tr trust Taraza and Weivel to uh, uh, represent us properly uh, in the judiciary. I wouldn't if I were you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Yeah, there's a good chance that you'll be done with leadership and then you'll be able to join them again, unfortunately. I think uh, you're correct. You can do what you can do what uh, uh, what cornbread does and have this a fake photograph of you look appearing to be, uh, uh, attending a public hearing. You could do that. Uh, okay. okay, so I, I'm. My, yes, go ahead. Somebody have a. Uh, I just had an announcement for my subcommittee. When sure, you uh, David. Okay, so um, motor vehicle subcommittee is supposed to meet tomorrow after hearings with snow coming and a lot of unknowns. Please uh, just keep your email boxes up front and center. There may be some adjustments. We, we may end up trying to meet a little early or with the snow, maybe not at all. I don't know, but it is getting to that point in the year, um, my fellow delegates, when things are starting to get really, really busy. So um, we have some work to do and just please bear with me and uh, just go with the flow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my leaders are going to meet at five o'clock, uh, I think. Yeah, at five o'clock. And uh, all the rest of you are free to go. So um, I'll see the leaders at five and the rest of you can 